Welcome mycophiles and all mushroom enthusiasts to our San Diego Mycological Society's 23rd Annual Fungus Fair. Hi, I'm your president, Michelle Yachimovich, and it's really an honor to welcome you today to our annual fungus fair. Since we can do it here in Balboa Park where we would naturally meet, we are coming to you virtually, still bringing you a day filled with amazing talks and lectures and demonstrations and information about everything here in San Diego all have to do with the Mycological Society. We're very excited to have you join us from San Diego or anywhere else that you are since we're virtual. And we hope that you get to enjoy, learn a little bit more about mushrooms and uh, to continue to grow our little strengthening mycelial connection from here and across the whole country. So thank you. Just go ahead, get your favorite chaga tea and sit back, enjoy and enjoy today. Hi, I'm Pat Nolan and I'm a longtime member of the San Diego Mycological Society and I'm here to tell you just a little bit about the history of the club. We started in the late 1990s. We had a lot of rain in 97, 98. We had some El Nino events and it's all of a sudden with all this rain, mushrooms started popping up all over the place and a lot of people were very interested in what was going on with that and what were these things coming up. And we just happened to, it just happened that it, Dr. Elio Schechter um, moved into San Diego County from the East Coast where he had belonged to a long time old mushroom club there. And a lot of people got together and decided we need to start a mushroom club here. So I first found the club through the very first mushroom fair in 1997. And I've been to every one since. And um, it's been really fun watching the club evolve as we've gone from mushroom fairs and various lectures to learning how to cook with mushrooms and how to grow them and how to dye uh, fabric with them and all the various other parts that fungi can evolve in. Um, hi everyone, my name is Matthew Meyer and I'm the membership manager for the San Diego Mycological Society. I'm in charge of making sure that everybody knows about all of the great benefits that um, we have as a member. You can go on forays and cooking classes and other workshops and such. And we are just about at 300 members, so we would love you to sign up and join and push us over the edge and expand our mycelial network. I'm also a graduate student at The Ohio State University, attending remotely from San Diego at the moment, studying mycology. Enjoy the fungus fair. Now I'd like to share some information about fun mushrooms you can find here in Southern California. But before I do that, I'd like to let you know a little bit more about the San Diego Mycological Society, along with who we are and what we do. So as you can see here, we do a variety of things such as meetings, uh, hold have speakers, conduct classes and forays and dinners and film screenings and identifications. So once a month, the first Monday of every month, we host lectures and speakers where from all walks of disciplines within mycology, from hardcore academic mycologists conducting research into ecology, let's say, to anthropologists or podcasters or artists. So from all walks of various different mycological life. And we also host regular cultivation classes, teaching you how to grow your own mushrooms, um, but in a variety of methods. As you can see here at the top left, we have spawn bags um, with straw, and we can also do log spawn, which will take a little bit longer to grow, but it will last much longer and have to give a higher yield. We also end up doing cooking demonstrations, such as what we, the video we released for our stuffed mushroom day earlier uh, a week ago. And one of our most popular activities are our forays. We will take groups of people, uh, typically inland to let's say Poway, or to uh, a little bit further northeast, uh, Santa Isabel, and we'll go look for mushrooms. Um, we'll go out and we'll have a good camaraderie with other people. It's a, like a big Easter egg hunt, but uh, you have no, nobody has any idea where any of the lay, eggs are laid or what the eggs are, uh, because they're all mushrooms. And you go and you bring them and you come back, and typically at the end, we'll all try to identify them together with expert identifiers. And every year, we host our annual fungus fair, which is what you're attending right now, but our 2021 virtual fungus fair. Typically, these are hosted in the room in which we hold our meetings and lectures, which is Casa del Prado, room 101. 
And we end up having a variety of vendors and um, educational material, including more lectures, as well as um, actual mushroom specimens that we had just collected a few days earlier from a big foray to display local mushrooms in the area from that year. And uh, also plenty of food. And we also end up hosting film screenings. For instance, in 2019, we hosted the premiere of Fantastic Fungi here in San Diego in two different locations, uh, the La Paloma Theater for North County in Encinitas and the Hotel Del Coronado in Coronado um, for South County. And this is a fantastic film that was filmed by Louis Schwartzberg, the documentary filmmaker. And Paul Stamets was a big subject of this film, as you all might know that name. And both of them happened to attend um, our screenings at or at screenings at Hotel Del Coronado, and Louis Schwartzberg also attended the La Paloma Theater screening. We also end up participating in many citizen science projects, such as the Mycoflora Project, which is a national uh, a national effort to try to document all of the various different fungi within um, North America. And oftentimes, it is used in conjunction with this other application that you can download on your phones called iNaturalist. Uh, it is an amazing application that allows you to take photos of any organism, animal, plant, fungus, algae, whatever, and it will try to do its best algorithmically to tell you what it is. But then on top of that, there's a community of identifiers which can confirm the algorithm's identification. And we can teach you all how to take proper pictures, um, getting all the correct identifying features for fungi. And if you're wanting to participate in the Mycoflora project, which requires DNA barcoding, we can also teach you how to properly collect, handle, and preserve specimens for DNA barcoding. So what do you need to look for when identifying mushrooms? Well, there are a variety of different structures on mushrooms that are useful for identifying them. Obviously, there's the cap. Um, and the margin or the gills or pores, as well as the stem and any other features such as a veil or a vulva and the spores, which you can get spore prints from. But in particular, in all of these features, you're going to want to be looking for the features on the left, the color, the shape, the size, the texture, the smell, and even just a little bit of the taste. Um, as well as the relevant environment. Is it growing next to the base of a tree? Is it growing on wood chips? Is it growing in grassland? Is it growing on dirt or sand? As well as the season, the time of the year. All of these things are incredibly relevant features for you to use to identify mushrooms um, by following keys. Or once you become very good, you'll be able to figure them out on your own without even following keys, especially if you know your area. So, Here's an example of a very common mushroom you might hear, see here in San Diego County. You've probably all seen this one, uh, Chlorophyllum molybides. It is known as the false parasol or the green spored lepiota or the vomiter. And it does live up to its name. It is poisonous, though not lethal, and it will make you vomit. So it is found in lawns and parks, and it's only actually found in California as well as Eastern North America, but not really in the middle of the country. And it has this really sort of green uh, spore print, uh, thus it also gets its other name, green spore lepiota. And they don't smell great, um, but you'll see them everywhere. They'll pop up all the time after rains. Another more interesting set of species, uh, the genus Ganoderma. There we have several different species of Ganoderma here in San Diego County and Southern California in general such as uh, Ganoderma polychromum or Aplanatum or brown, brownie eye. All of them uh, are here and they can take on all various different shapes and sizes and they grow on the sides of trees, both living and dead. And while the reason why it says the variability or the edibility is variable is because while they're not poisonous, they're very tough and hard. So you wouldn't really want to eat them, but they are used oftentimes for medicinal purposes. And you can find Ganoderma species all around the world, although there are specialized species in given areas, such as these three, which are only found here in Southern California. 
Then there are many agaricus species uh, that you can also find here. Agaricus species you'll be very familiar with because they are the traditional button mushrooms or field mushrooms. You, these are the ones that you will see in the stores, such as agaricus bisporus, which is white button mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and portobello. That one species is all three of those mushrooms in the food store, um, in the grocery store. You are being lied to if you think that they are three separate species. They are one species taken at different stages of development. But there are many other species of agaricus beyond agaricus bisporus, and some of them are quite delicious and other of the others are quite poisonous. There's um, a xanthodermis, a bitotorcus, and a californicus. All of these three are found here in Southern California. And a general rule of thumb, which you should not use as a definitive statement, is when it comes to agaricus species, the majority of agaricus species that bruise yellow when you damage them when the, the color they bruise is yellow those are typically poisonous versus those that bruise red are typically edible again do not use that as your only factor to base it off of but it is a good rule of thumb and you can find these species anywhere on grass dirt sand leaves uh, they're quite variable where you can find them and then we have astraeus hygrometricus which is commonly known as the hydroscopic earth star or barometer earth star or fault earth star. So it is an earth star and it gets its name because of its appearance. It's typically in the dirt or sand or rocks and it ends up having this really beautiful, almost flower-like shape, but with this big bulbous puffball in the center. And it is a puffball mushroom, which means that when the rain comes down and raindrops will hit it and it will puff up giant plumes of spores. Uh, other manual stimulation, you can poke it and it will do the same thing, or um, even like following debris from trees or animals scurrying by, those will all also puff it, but it is typically done during the rain. And interestingly, these things are edible, um, although it's typically not eaten here in the United States, but in Thailand, this species is actually considered a delicacy when they are young before they get old and crusty like this, they're actually still all enveloped and they're served like pickled um, and sauteed and apparently they're quite tender and delicious. I have not partaken myself, but I would be interested at some point in time. And you can find them all around the world, um, including here. This one is a particularly interesting species, uh, Leuco coprinicus or coprinus tricolor. It does not have any common names because it is only really found here in North America and it's only really found in potted plants, interestingly enough. So there are some rare exceptions where you can find it outside, but the vast majority of the times it is found in potted plants, cultivated specifically. And because of this, we're not entirely sure about its origins, but we do know it is inedible. Um, it is mildly poisonous. But again, you mostly wouldn't want to eat it because it does not taste good. Um, and you don't need to worry about it. If it's in your potted plants, it will not damage your plants. So no need to take it out. Just enjoy the nice, pretty yellow mushrooms. Uh, so long as you do not have any animals that might eat it, such as dogs or cats. Um, it might make their stomach upset if they get a hold of it. And another really interesting species is the Bushwaldo bolitis. Uh, Saphrocophatus. Um, I apologize for butchering the pronunciation of that Latin name, but its common name is the golden bolete. So, a common feature of pretty much all boletes are this big, thick stem and a bulbous, a bulbous top, which is thick. And instead of gills, you have pores, these holes, which allow the spores to come out of instead of these slitted gills. And because this is only found along the California coast, it's not particularly well described. And some people believe it is edible and others don't. So it's possible that it's one of those situations where some people have a tolerance to any number of the various different compounds within it and others are intolerant. Um, so it could just be down to a personal level. And you'll typically find these, though, on stumps and sawdust. And it has this very nice and brilliant yellow and a little bit of a red, a reddish stem. And another very charismatic uh, mushroom you'll find here is 
Lateramyces cerris, which is otherwise known as the chip cherry or red lead roundhead. So these are poisonous, unfortunately, but they're quite beautiful. And you can find them in wood chips, as their common name, chip cherry, suggests. And you can find them pretty much everywhere in the world along coasts, which is very interesting, this particular species. So while there are many more species that we could talk about, such as the bluet or lion's mane or turkey tail, we're going to leave it with those for the time being. And if you would like more information about what mushrooms exist here in Southern California um, and identifying any mushrooms you might happen to find on your next hike, we again highly recommend that you download the application iNaturalist or consult with um, the website Mushroom Observer. Or if you would like to, in addition to all of those, you can also upload photos to our San Diego Mycological Society Facebook page or our new Facebook group, SD Myco Community. You can also send us a message on Instagram or tag us on Instagram with a post or email us directly at sdmyco um, or sorry, sdmyco at gmail.com. And we're also affiliated with other mushroom events and conferences, such as NAMA, which is the North American Mycological Society. Um, we also um, are affiliated with some other mushroom fairs that you might be interested in, such as the Telluride Mushroom Festival or the Wisconsin uh, Conference for Women in Mushrooms. And if you'd like to know more, um, you should join us for our virtual meetings of the first Monday of every month, and you should become a member, which um, gives you access to all of our fantastic workshops and, um, and forays and such, especially more so in normal times, but we're also putting together amazing events to make up for it during these quarantine times. And membership is only $25 for an entire year, 365 days. And under normal circumstances, we would be meeting in, again, Balboa Park, Casa del Prado, Room 101, uh, the first Monday of every month. And feel free to join us, please, uh, at sdmyco.org. That's where you can find our membership on our website. And if you'd like to watch the film, um, Fantastic Fungi, you can go to vimeo.com slash on demand slash fantastic fungi. Uh, highly recommend that film. It was amazing. And we were very proud to be able to put it on. So enjoy the rest of the fair. Thank you all so much for your time. Welcome back, San Diego. I hope that you enjoyed that little information about our club and why it's so important. Um, a little bit about our history and what has brought uh, mushrooms to San Diego and including the fact that maybe now you'll have a little better perspective on what you're finding out there. Um, next, it's going to be a pleasure to introduce uh, the President of NAMA from the North American Mycological Association, um, Barbara Chang. Welcome. Um, Barbara's going to be 
Farb is going to be talking to us a little bit more about NAMA, the same thing that, you know, we just went through our history. This is going to be about the history of the North American Mycological Association. There's around 80 little affiliated clubs all over, just like here in San Diego, all over North America. And this is kind of like the umbrella of what keeps all these societies together. Just now that as we're going back through Zoom, you will have so many more opportunities to go out and scope out um, different areas of the country and what mushrooms they have to offer. But um, I would love for you guys to really pay attention to NAMA because um, they're, they're the ones, the mycelial connection that bring us together. Um, and just a little bit on Barbara. She is the NAMA president. She's going to be going into her third year. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, meeting uh, Barbara both at um, the foray for NAMA, which she'll tell you a little bit more about over in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the Mycelial Mysteries out in Wisconsin when it was a group gathering of women, um, around 200 women, um, just talking about mushrooms. So it, she's been teaching classes. She's a professor in Iowa, lives in Iowa and Ames. And um, one of her little fascinations about mushrooms was when she was younger, um, her grandmother used to make a lot of mushroom uh, dishes, but they were all canned mushrooms. And still there was a fascination and a love for them. Um, so a lot of the people get interested in mushroom forging from the grandmothers, but this was all about cooking. And throughout time and foraging and going out to nature, she got to explore and learn more about mushrooms and um, worked her way up. And now she's the president making amazing things for NAMA. So thank you so much, Barbara, again, for joining us. And um, I'd love to hear more about, about NAMA. Thank you, Michelle. It's exciting to be here in San Diego, more or less. I wish I really was there. Um, so thank you for having me. And I'm glad to have this audience to tell you more about the North American Mycological Association. Michelle's already told you it's an association of clubs. And your club here in San Diego is one of our affiliated clubs. Um, and this pooling of resources we can do as an umbrella organization with clubs around the nation allows us to do a lot of really fun things and a lot of really important things. And I'll talk about that more uh, later. But in the meantime, I want you to, I want to share some, some information about NAMA's history and really emphasize the resilience we have, just like your club here in San Diego has. COVID has really showed us um, that we're very resilient and we can think of ways to carry on with our mission of learning more about fungus and making more friends, uh, no matter what. I'm gonna share a screen for a few minutes because um, there's a lot of information and I wanna get it right. Um, and it's reading it will help you absorb it too. Uh, organization started in 1959 and fascinatingly enough, it was a sort of government initiative to support clubs and groups and uh, kind of educational fun gatherings put together by people wherever they live. Uh, so it's NAMA started as the People to Com People Committee on Fungi in 1959. Um, and it was, as you can see, if I, if I move the screen a little bit, you might be able to read more of it yourself even, but um, this was an initiative that Dwight Eisenhower started uh, to encourage international friendship, but also clearly within the nation, within the United States too, putting people together to explore common interests, learn things, do things. Um, it's, it definitely sounds very Cold War era, um, People to People Committee on Fungi and Harry Knighton uh, and Elsie Knighton, uh, the founders, um, stayed with NAMA when it became an independent organization. 
And to this day, we give the Harry and Elsie S. Knighton Award each year at our annual gathering, the annual foray, to a NAMA member who has done exemplary service for their clubs. Um, so uh, somebody who's an excellent volunteer for their club affiliated with NAMA. So we NAMA forms a committee to take nominations and do this award every year. Uh, NAMA and all the affiliated clubs are volunteer run. We really are people to people. And we managed to do this uh, Zoom to people too. Uh, an example as, as your annual mushroom fair, really a good example of NAMA's resilience. So we have been active for 70, roughly 70 years and persisted uh, year after year, even in this year when it first seemed like we aren't, weren't going to be able to do anything. We had to cancel our annual foray, for example. But let's talk about that now. That's our big event every year, is a foray, a na national foray. Um, it's, again, the strength of combined resources, people to people and club to club, allow us to put on a foray every year, different location, um, but last several days. And the site selection is based on the on high hopes and strong probabilities of finding a lot of mushrooms. My favorite part of a foray is the mushroom identification process and mushroom identification tables. So, um, but first I probably should tell you more about places we've held recent forays. Last year, we had planned to have our foray in the Ozark foothills, a little bit southwest of St. Louis, but because of COVID, we had to cancel. It was an October foray. Uh, that is the best time to find mushrooms in the Midwest in the fall. There is that burst of morels early spring, but fall is the most abundant and most variety of mushrooms in the Midwest. We're hoping, and the Missouri Mycological Society, um, known as MOMS, will was going to co-host that foray, and um, we hope we can do it in 2022, reschedule it in 2022. In 2021, vaccinations permitting, we will be hosting the annual foray in outside of Estes Park in the Rocky Mountains, and the Colorado Mycological Society will be very involved in helping to organize and um, host there. That will be in mid-August. And it's it's looking, I, I have some optimism about uh, the vaccines um, making it possible for us to attend and host this foray. So that's our plan for the next two years. We have been vouchering the for the mushrooms we have found at our forays for many years. This is another por important part of our history is advancing mycology throughout the North American myco continent. And we have hosted forays in Canada before. And Michelle and I are going to do our best to make sure we can have a foray in Mexico soon. So because, again, our name is North American Mycological Association. Back to the vouchering. We're very involved in identifying the mushrooms of our continent, right? Uh, the European mushrooms are very well documented. We're a younger country, a vaster country, and our voucher program, uh, and a voucher is a record, uh, if you're familiar with how herbariums work, plants are vouchered in herbariums, is um, proof that a mushroom was found and identified in such and such place on such and such a day. And the dried specimen and spore print is preserved along with that. Um, we'll be doing a program, by the way, in February about um, the vouchers that George Washington Carver deposited at the Iowa State University Herbarium, Fungarium, while he was a student here. So, Vouchers are historical in any number of ways about who was finding them, when, where, documenting that such and such a mushroom does, does appear in such and such a place. 
We've been doing this for years, as I as I say, with records of what we found in every place we have uh, hunted for mushrooms. And, and these are all um, at the Field Museum. So we've been doing this for years. But before they end up as dried specimens at the Field Museum, we lay them out at table after table after table at the foray as they come in after each day's forays. It is my favorite thing of all to do at the foray and just such a great example of what people to people, uh, the us in fungus, so to speak, uh, do when they uh, get together and hunt for mushrooms and share what they find. You can walk along these tables and they don't put duplicates out. There'll be table after table of mushrooms that were brought in, identified by the mycologist in chief and the other mycologists present and mycology students who identify and label, put them out on tables and you can walk by and see real examples of mushrooms you may have only looked at in books before when we all go out in the woods together and come back together and identify them. So it's one of the great educational and fun things we do at Forays. We also have lectures. Uh, if you have ideas for a lecturer you would like to see, a presenter you would like to see, or an activity you would like to see at the annual foray, let me know. My email is easy, president at N-A-M-Y-C-O dot org, president at namico dot org. Um, so that's a little bit of our history and our future. We're involved in the, the uh, North American Microflora Project. They're now calling themselves the Fundus, uh, a nonprofit group working to create a document of the fun, fungi that we can find in North America. So we have a important future ahead of us. Uh, in addition to all the fun we can have year after year after year, but this important future in helping document the, 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 the macrofungi, the mycoflora, whatever we want to call them, of North America. NAMA also has a public service component, and uh, giving back to communities is, is always important, I think, uh, in any kind of organization, people to people. Um, Fungophobia is a thing, right? Um, um, one of the reasons I think I was not taught how to look for mushrooms at an early age was that fear of I'd put anything and everything in my mouth, right? That's what little kids do. Um, so we uh, identify um, identifiers, let me put it that way. We maintain a list of people in every state who can help identify toxic mushrooms in really scary emotional situations. Yes, of course, toddlers will you know, put anything in their mouth, but most frequently we hear from upset pet owners. It's whose dog or cat seems to have eaten a mushroom, maybe having some kind of gastric dis distress. We often hear from veterinarians as well for guidance on how to figure out what mushroom was eaten, if it's poison, what kind of poison, because poisoning is a spectrum of feeling sick for a day or two to uh, needing to get to the emergency room right now. Um, so it's a sort of counseling service, uh, first, uh, at least in the first encounter, um, but a way to help people who of course, want to save their pets or their child. Um, or, you know, we often hear from college students who are now suddenly are concerned about the mushrooms they just ate, that kind of thing. So um, helping get the word out, helping get the word out in a timely manner, help getting advice, counseling, putting in touch with an identifier is something we do. And every year, Michael Bug, who is our toxicology chair, puts together a report of poisonings that we that have been brought to our attention, that have come to our attention, either because we've talked to the person who wants to report it and know what to do about it, or we hear about it from veterinarians. So uh, trying to help people who have had a bad encounter with mushrooms is one of the important things we do through uh, reporting, but also on another screen, you can see a list of identifiers. So if you're 
in San Diego, um, you can see if there is a veterinarian or a pharmacist or a mycologist who has some experience and can give you some next steps to take. There are very few actual deaths by mushroom poisoning, by the way, on a year-to-year -year basement basis. Keep in mind that, you know, from an upset stomach to death is the spectrum of things we would call toxic reactions or poisoning. So it would be great if you joined NAMA. Uh, if, if you're a member of the San Diego Club, you can join with a $5 discount because your club is uh, already a NAMA member. And in return, you will he get get word right away when registration for the National Foray is open. You must be a member to attend. Uh, often the, red, the, the foray fills up. So getting a timely uh, invitation to register is a valuable thing. You also get our bi-monthly publication, which we call a newsletter. It's more like a magazine because we email out announcements of upcoming events like Zoom meetings or Zoom presentations. And you'll get invitation to those Zoom presentations and they're either free or um, maybe five or $10. Thank you for showing that cover. Exact, you can see that the cover is more like a magazine. Photography is a big uh, interest of, of our organization. We have many members who are excellent photographers. We have a Photography contest each year. We try to put members' artwork and photography on the cover here of the mica file. So you get that mica file six times a year. You get invitations to the foray and to register for the foray and to the Zoom events, which is something we just started this year. Um, an example of our resilience, our commitment, and just urge to stay in touch and uh, with fungi and with each other. So. Uh, I really encourage you to, in, to join and to volunteer, get involved. If you want to get more involved in producing a journal, in writing, in sharing your photography, you can get involved in any of these things. Uh, we have a photography committee as well. Um, help us plan forays. Help us uh, put together our Zoom programming. We have any number of committees and ways for you to volunteer. Um, and I encourage you to do it. I, and I can say that we have a lot of fun just even getting in, in meeting. And it's, you'll make friends, too. Uh, you're going to learn more, find more fun guy, and you'll make friends. Well, how I know Michelle from getting together for, manga, for, for fun goes mushroom events. And how I'm glad to know Cassandra now, too. But uh, there's just... It's a way to stay in touch with mushrooms all year. Your season in San Diego is starting soon, and I bet it's ending soon, too. That's how it feels uh, where I live in Iowa. From the first morel to the last maitake, that's a short fraction of the year. So uh, NAMA will keep you doing uh, and immersed in something you really enjoy year-round. You can also join other affiliate clubs. Uh, Michelle, are you in other clubs besides the San Diego Club? Um, yes, in LA and then as a group, we've decided to start um, joining all our California clubs, you know, because we're trying to, if we're going to in the future change legislature or bring like um, the mushroom, last year we voted on a state mushroom. And <laughs> so we would like to start um, again, increasing the environmental awareness and we're yes. going to be more profitable if we can do it um, as, as, a, as a whole state. So great. We definitely yeah. want to support. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the Minnesota mushroom club and I joined the Missouri club and I've gone to, that's a border state uh, from Iowa. I've gone to some of their events. Uh, California is a big state, but as you know, if you're in a small state, you might want to join your neighboring states clubs too, so that you can go to more forays during your own mushroom season. Uh, you, you probably do ID at your own forays too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the Minnesota club, which is the club, which is actually closest to me, there is an Iowa club, but um, the part of Iowa I'm in is an easy drive to the twin cities. Um, there's mushroom, there's identification sessions every Monday night during mushroom season. That's that's fun too. Do, and do you do that? 
Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And one of the things too, um, when we do our, um, our forays, and usually, especially for the fair, we would have experts come from LA or even sometimes um, Bob Cummings from Santa Barbara, who's spoken at our club a bunch. He's mm -hmm. the one who knows most about toxicology. So we already, since um, Southern California, it doesn't have as much, um, as many mushrooms as in other places. So we, uh, people will drive to, to forays when, when, whenever we can yeah. find them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you can go to more forays if you join an affiliate club too, or just ask if you can come just this once and then <laughs> see if you, see if you join. Yeah. And, and having noted uh, identifiers or mycologists, right. It's like meeting a rock star some, you know, like when you were a teenager, right. Now, uh, you know, it'd be like, uh, I'll meet Noah Siegel, I hope someday soon. It'd be like, you know, when I was 16, if I met Neil Young or something, I'm dating, I'm, I'm dating myself there. So you get to meet the myco mycologists and ask them things you've always wondered or get help with this one mushroom you've never been able to identify. So really lots of benefits to being in a local and um, a national organization. Yeah, especially now, like I'm saying, Zoom, we're, we're going to be able to talk to each other a lot more. Yeah. But that is one of the greatest things about the NAMA foray. So I hope those watching will eventually make it to one of them because yeah. you're getting such a wide variety of people of amazing T-shirts that everybody brings uh, from all the years. Yes, yes. The club. Yes, yes. Um, the wealth of knowledge from you know the young kids that some people bring their kids to some people it's that, so fun when you know, there's young kids like in their pain. Mm -hmm. yes i've met so many amazing children um on forays too you know young kids who know all these mushrooms already and they're so excited that's it's great too and i guess this is a good time you know to sum it up the events are family friendly family friendly for the most part uh, there's usually nice playgrounds at the foray sites there's been some that don't have them and swimming pools if it's that time of year so yeah they're family good kind of vacation events too yeah yeah and we thank you for all your work that you're putting together. It is a lot of work. We know from our board yes. um, how much yeah. it takes, you know, to put all of this together. But at the end, we're really having the same focus about helping educate people about yeah. mushrooms, about the environment um, and how to do it in a way that, you know, that people love. Yes, yes. And a couple quickly mentioned how to cultivate mushrooms. We usually have a workshop or two about that at 4 Ace if you want to grow mushrooms at home or in your yard. Um, and but micro remediation, maybe how to use mushrooms to restore damage sites um, or learning about that. And there is some public policy we need to interact with as well, uh, as Michelle mentioned making sure we have places that we can look for mushrooms uh, is, is becoming a, an important thing. So I'm so glad to be here. I hope to hear from some of you and see you, uh, see you at a foray. And uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments as well. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. We'll put up the little blurb about NAMA um so you will find out where you can register but again it's filled with contest and information and committees and dyers clubs so please check them out um thank you so much again barbara it was such a pleasure to see you thank you everyone have fun This place has mushrooms coming out, it's everything. It's like a theme park of mushroom hunting. The mushrooms are as beautiful as a wildflower and more exciting to find, because you know, you might be the first person in the last 35 years that ever saw that there. A lot of them I know from books, and they're arriving in the flesh on those tables in multiples. At the 2017 NAMA Northwoods Foray up here in Northern Wisconsin, we've had been having a, a complete blast. NAMA represents the largest group of collectors, amateur mycologists, 
professional mycologists and people just interested in general in mushroom-forming fungi. It's really exciting at a NAMA event because it is such a blending of people with such varied interests and such varied skill levels. Some are college professors, some are self-taught. Lots of people working at different universities or herbarium that I get to, to meet and actually talk to. I've read their books, I've read their papers. So NAMA is a great place to interact with people and learn from them. I was blown away by the different uh, if you want, mushroom cultures that I discovered at NAMA. It's kind of a big interconnected web like mycelium. There are discussions about so many issues. So it's not just toxicology and it is not just taxonomy and it is not just cooking with wild mushrooms. Everything comes together. And I've always wanted to have some kind of like little recording system that recorded all the conversations at NAMA foray and wrote them up because there's so much information exchanged. When uh, an expert in a group of mushrooms is really not sure what they're looking at because they're seeing it for the first or second time, that's when things get really exciting. I think it's important to study fungi because they're everywhere and they're holding everything together. Then you start seeing the connections of mushrooms and green plants and mushrooms and insects and all the interactions, uh, ecological interactions. And a lot of understanding of environmental stability comes from gaps in our knowledge and a huge gap can be the fungi because fungi are incredibly diverse and all of that diversity represents different individual roles that fungi can have and play in terms of stabilizing the environment and contributing to the health of ecosystems. There's a whole resurgence of folks interested in getting out into the woods now, into the forest. What is nature? What's our role here on the planet? And what role does fungi play? Once people start to learn about mushrooms, they realize that there's it's sort of the biological frontier. We think that probably we've described about 5 or 6% of the total fungal diversity on Earth. So that's what keeps me going. I can come here and I can see things I've never seen before at a foray like this. People come here to listen to lectures, go to workshops on cultivating, and learn about identification of mushrooms, but we know the real reason they're here. It's to pick and eat wild mushrooms. The chanterelle soup was my favorite. Like the pickle, yeah. end of the woods, yeah. rimpola frondosa. I like the mataki tea. Mycology brings people together out of the fear of getting poisoned, basically. That's the, that's the real truth of the matter. Mycology also brings people together because we share common knowledge. If you're interested in mycology, there's no better way to, to learn and to be inspired than to come to a foray like the Nama foray. The best way to learn a mushroom is to see it in person, to have someone at a foray say, well, that's what it is, and it looks like this, and you have the other mushroom there to put the two together, and so you know this is edible, this is poisonous. And while they look a little bit alike, seeing them together with an expert to talk about them is a really a good way to learn them. And I'm before you have 200, 300 people, so you get exposed to lots of different aspects of how people are interested and interact with mushrooms and weird fungi that you never knew about and they know how to find them. Folks who are interested in fungi should join a local club. NAMA has 80 affiliated clubs and learn from the local club and then extend their knowledge by joining NAMA. Joining a mushroom club was a great way to start, but coming to NAMA, you have amazing individuals that are doing a lot in the world of fungi. One of the beauties of NAMA is that it's in a different place every year. You know, it's always nice to see some different mushrooms that you've never, never seen. I think mushroom people mostly just want to be in the woods. I do. When you go in the woods, you feel extremely peaceful all of a sudden. I would love to come back to NAMA um, year after year. It's really a very synergistic kind of gathering where there's a lot of people who know a lot of things about a lot of different things. And so we can all learn from each other and find out what's here and, and what fungi do and what they are and what the different kinds of species are. Just as long as I can spread my spores, that's great.
I'm Mary Ann Hawk. I'm a scientist with the San Diego Mycological Society. I love the way that mycology brings together such a diverse group of people who all have their own reasons for being interested in fungi, whether it's through science, cultivation, food, human health, ecological health, travel, or art. I'm really glad that you're here. So today we're going to dive into a fascinating topic, the mysterious hidden life of spores. You may not know it yet, but fungal spores are important in your life. These fascinating microscopic spores are colorful, beautiful, and incredibly complex, perfectly designed for the important role they play in nature. Let's dive in. When the microscope was invented around 1590, suddenly we saw a new world of living things in our water, in our food, and under our nose. The word spore was used for the first time by this man, Johann Hedwig, back in the 1700s. He was skilled at microscopy and biological illustration, and, was, and eventually he directed the Leipzig Botanical Garden. Hedwig was actually known as the father of bryology because of his work on mosses. So where do spores come from? Let's start with something simple. If you think of a typical mushroom that a child might draw, it has a cap on top and a stalk underneath. And then there are gills. That's where the spores are produced. These microscopic spores are designed to spread around through the air or by water in order to make even more mushrooms. Apparently, an eight centimeter mushroom produces as many as 40 million spores in an hour. Of course, being science, it is a bit more complicated than that. There are three basic types of spores depending on how they're produced. Canidia, shown across the top, are vegetative spores, so they are asexual. The other two are sexual spores, and they're called basidiospores or ascospores, depending on the type of fungus that makes them. In the group of gilled mushrooms, the spore-forming tissues, called basidia, are located on the gills on the underside of the cap. The basidiospores are dropped from the gills when mature. In the other group, called sac fungi, the spore-producing sacs, called acci, are located on the inner surface of the mature fruiting body. These ascospores are released in a cloud when the acci break open. Ascospores, their development is shown here across the top, are produced by the sac fungi. So as their name implies, their spores are produced inside a sac. So they look a bit like peas in a pod, illustrated here by the fungus called Neurospora. Basidiospores, shown across the bottom, develop externally at the tip and are not enclosed in a sac. To help me remember the difference between them, I call ascospores innies and basidiospores outies. So now we know a bit more about different kinds of fungal spores and how they're produced. But what are they for? Basically, the answer is re reproduction, dispersal, and survival. And of course, this being science, the different types of spores have a variety of specialized names depending on the type of fungus that produce them. But as it turns out, that's quite important for identifying fungi and pathologists look at spore shape and appearance to tell them apart so they know which ones they're dealing with. Spores vary in shape from spherical to ellipsoid with different shaped ends. They also vary in their surface ornamentation, from warts and ridges to long pointed spines. Some spores, like the marine fungi, even have appendages around their middle or at their terminal ends. Ingoldian fungi. These aquatic fungi are named after C.T. Ingold, the British mycologist who first studied them. These are some examples of diverse spore morphologies that can be found in foam from freshwater streams. Who knew? Fungal spores can be complex and multi-layered. Here's what they can look like in cross-section. At the bottom is a picture I took with the scanning electron microscope showing the layers of the wall of a commonly found soil fungus. Spores are very beautiful, as this lovely illustration shows. They come in a dizzying array of shapes and sizes and look like they came from some kind of fantasy novel or alien world. 
When you look at them with an electron microscope, some fungal spores look a lot like plant pollen. That's pollen from a sunflower in the top left and a spore from puffball fungus in the lower right. Why does that matter? Because both can cause allergies in people. Just look at those menacing looking spikes. This is a picture of a variety of types of pollen taken with an electron microscope. Pollen that most commonly causes allergic reactions are produced by the plain looking plants, trees, grasses, and weeds that do not have showy flowers. These plants manufacture small, light, dry pollen granules that are custom made for wind transport, just like fungal spores. The pollen becomes lodged in the mucous membranes of the nasal passages when you breathe them in. The immune system produces immunoglobulin E, or IgE, antibodies to fight invading allergens. Even though everyone has some IgE, an allergic person has an unusually large army of these IgE defenders. Special cells called mast cells are frequently injured during this warring between the IgE antibodies and the allergens. When injured, the mast cells release a variety of chemicals into the tissues and blood, one of which is known as histamine. These chemicals are very irritating and cause itching, swelling, and fluid leaking from the cells. So that's why hay fever sufferers take antihistamines. Speaking of health, this article appeared in the LA Times just a few weeks ago. Scientists say that spores are likely spread on wind currents caused by wildfire. Wildland firefighters can get sick with valley fever after working on a fire incident. The illness is contracted by inhaling fungal spores of the genus Coccidioides, a path pathogenic fungus that resides in the soil in certain parts of the southwestern United States. And it can cause fever, cough, and a rash. Here's another reason why fungal spores are important to people. Fungi can, can cause costly rot and diseases in our crops, such as wine grapes and tomatoes, or spoil the food in our fridge. San Diego County has a large flower growing and nursery industry that has to be protected from plant pathogens. Fungi can also cause problems for human health, from athlete's foot and yeast infections of the to lung infections like the valley fever I just mentioned, or a blastomycosis. Spore dispersal. Fungi do produce a prolific amount of spores and the way that these are dispersed in nature is very interesting. Some of the methods are active and some of them are passive. So what do we mean by that? Ballistospores are the active type that are usually shot from their basidia. The rust, jelly fungi, and other groups of fungi may produce these kinds of active spores. So how do they shoot their spores? Well, one mechanism acts when a tiny droplet, called a Buller's drop, rapidly forms and shifts its mass in a way that pushes the spore. The energy of spore discharge comes from the rapid surface tension powered movement of the Buller's drop onto the spore surface that catapults the spore away. Ultra high speed video cameras show that these ballista spores can catapult into the air at initial accelerations in excess of 10,000 G. That's pretty amazing. Coprophilus fungi use the dung of herbivores as substrates. The ascospores are sticky and darkly pigmented so they can survive gastric juices and UV light. The mechanisms of spore dispersal of these fungi guarantee that the spores are propelled from the dung onto nearby vegetation, mostly by these ballistic mechanisms, where the fungi will be eaten along with the plant material and passed through the animal digestive system to repeat the cycle. A fine example of an artillery fungus is pylobolus, which lives in animal dung. It produces these black asexual sporangium that look like a cannonball on the end of a long stalk. Below the cannonball is a special balloon that fills with water in the morning sun. When the water pressure gets high enough, the balloon suddenly bursts, launching the cannonball into the air. Wikipedia says this involves acceleration equivalent to a human being being launched at 100 times the speed of sound. That's pretty amazing. 
The orientation of the stalk towards the early morning sun apparently guarantees that the sporangium is shot some distance away, which improves the chance that it will attach to vegetation and be eaten by a new host. Start the cycle all over again. I love this one too. Isn't it pretty? Spherobolus stellatus, another type of cannonball fungus, develops basidiospores in a large gelatinous ball-like mass within this cup-shaped structure. Here's a cross-sectional view. At maturity, the inner layer of the cup separates from the outer layer and suddenly inverts like a trampoline forcibly ejecting the spores containing the ball into the air. You just can't make this stuff up. Ascospores can be phototrophic too and move towards light, as in many members of the Pezzazales. Explosive discharge is attributed to changes in turgor pressure that are caused by water uptake, sort of like a squirt gun. Then there's the passive type of spore dispersal that requires the help of wind, water, or animals. I love that our British friend Ingold called these methods blow off, splash off, or shake off, which kind of explains everything you need to know. These exquisite bird's nest fungi, so-called because they look like tiny bird's nests with little eggs in it, are activated when hit by raindrops. Here's a cross-sectional view of a similar species. Isn't the level of complexity and sophistication remarkable for something less than the size of a penny? Now let's turn to spore color. You can set the cap of a mushroom down on a piece of paper and let it sit, and later you'll find fungal spores deposited in a ring pattern. This is called a spore print. The color of the spores can be used to help identify the fungus. Color in nature is another one of those fascinating topics that I could talk about for hours. While beautiful, the colors play a very important function. They are produced by secondary metabolism. That means there are chemicals not directly involved in normal growth, development, or reproduction of the organism, but instead they play important ecological functions. Some secondary compounds, such as pigments, polyols, and mycosporines, are associated with pathogenicity, and others with tolerance to environmental stressors, including temperature and UV light. The most famous fungal secondary metabolite you might have heard of is penicillin, which was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. Spore coloration is often used as an aid to identification of species. Colors are generally pink, red, orange, yellow, purple, olive, green, or gray. The color may, represent, may present itself in the spore wall. It could be within the cytoplasm, in oil droplets, or even in the membranes. Often the colors are caused by carotenoids, such as the common orange beta carotene or dark red lycopene. Other complex pigments like dark black melanin may be present. These are microscopic images of several different fungal spores. Agaricus spore walls are darkly pigmented. This is common in fungi found in xeric habitats. Lycoperdon spores appear brown and spores of the desert fungus batarea are an orangey rust color. These colors are produced by the secondary metabolites such as anthocyanins. What's the role of color? Well, it provides protection from damaging effects of radiation like exposure to UV light and from desiccation. Coloration provides resistance during dispersal and aids long-term survival in harsh environments. The black melanins absorb radiation and dissipate energy into their double ring structure, which protects the spore membrane. Fungal pigments such as this dark brown one from Pyzolithus can be extracted. They have a lot of uses, including the dyeing of wool and fabrics. At our annual fungus fair in Balboa Park each February, we usually have artisans who use fungal dyes to produce beautiful clothing products. Pigments can even be used as ink to make paintings and drawings. Fungal spores may also be fluorescent. I took these pictures of glowing spores with a special microscope under different wavelengths of light. So now we can finish off our talk by looking at some fun and interesting fungal spores. And I have to credit Dr. Pat Nolan of the San Diego Mycological Society for suggesting some of these. 
The canidia of this plant pathogen are quite distinctive and are known as three-tailed mice. Fusarium is commonly found in soil and some types are important pathogens in plants and animals. It can have three different spore types. These ones called macro canidia are really big and look a bit like striped bananas. Some aquatic fungi have beautiful star shapes. These live in fresh water and eat leaves. These types of tetraradiate spores have even been found in fossils from 20 million years ago. Some, like these, look like cannonballs. Their dark coloration protects them from harsh environmental conditions. I'll end with this one, Spongiforma square pantsii. Yes, it is named after the cartoon character SpongeBob SquarePants. I guess the scientists thought that when the spores were viewed under the scanning electron microscope, they looked like orange sea sponges. Isn't nature amazing? Thank you for listening to my talk, and I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into the hidden life of spores. Welcome to our cultivation segment. Uh, my name is Sam Androsco and I am a cultivating mycologist uh, consultant. I grow mushrooms for a living and uh, today we're going to show you how to make up your own mushroom growing kits at home. Uh, so first thing I want to go over with, uh, with you guys is that uh, mushrooms require some form of carbon a little bit of nitrogen um, to grow and to uh, uh, fruit. Um, so the things that we're going to need today are a substrate. Today we're going to use either core and I'm going to show you how to use hardwood pellets to make your mushroom kit. Um, Mushrooms can also grow on cardboard. They can grow on leaves, uh, as long as they're dry. Straw, uh, we can use wood shavings, uh, sawdust. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the pellet form, but I'm gonna show you how an easy way to uh, grow mushrooms on pellets today, because it's just super simple. And uh, we'll also need some spawn. The home cultivator usually isn't going to be doing all of the lab work. Uh, there's plenty of stores out there online and in certain cities uh, where you can go and you can buy uh, what they call grain spawn or sawdust spawn. I have an example of sawdust spawn here. Uh, this is sawdust that's been hydrated and inoculated with a certain type of mushroom, in this case, uh, shiitake mushrooms. And uh, um, 
from there, uh, what we do in the lab is we gather uh, a mushroom in the wild. And this mushroom has some certain type of characteristic that we like. And what we do is we bring it home and we clone it. And we open the mushroom up and take little pieces of sterile tissue out of the inside. We stick it on agar and we grow it out. And once we have a nice, pure, clean culture, we expand that onto either the grain or the sawdust or some type of special media that we make up uh, to uh, allow the mushroom to propagate and uh, create a nice sterile uh, media from which the mushroom can jump off of into our substrate. And the substrate provides the cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin uh, that the mushrooms are going to digest to produce fruit bodies. Um, so let's get going here. I heated some water up uh, so we have some uh, water to uh, pasteurize our media. And uh, the first one I want to show you is how to make a sawdust bag. Um, this is a method you'll, if you look this up online, uh, most everybody is calling this the Lipotech. And uh, what happens is um, we're going to use uh, these hardwood pel fuel pellets. And uh, you can get these at Lowe's, Home Depot, Tractor Supply, uh, but you want to make sure they're hardwood. Um, if you use pine or Douglas fir, you know, those type of pellets, uh, the only mushroom you're going to really be able to use with those is Pleurotus pulmonarius. Uh, they can digest it pretty well, as well as shiitake, but um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so we're going to stick to hardwood pellets. These are, this is a competition blend. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of alder and oak and mesquite, uh, kind of like all the remnants put together. And uh, just pick the cheapest bag of hardwood pellets you can find. Uh, I think they run about $20 a, a bag or so for a, a 20 pound bag of basically a dollar a pound. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a bag. In this case, I recommend using an HDPE bag or a polypropylene bag because they both can sustain high temperatures. Uh, this is a myco bag. Uh, this is, has a filter patch on it, and in the in mushroom industry, we use these to sterilize substrates in an autoclave. Um, so they can withstand up to about 260 degrees or so. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take four cups of hardwood pellets. We're going to stick it in our bag, just like that. So this, this is a quart of... Um, quart deli cup of pellets and we're going to be really careful and so this is a four cup one quart little saucepan be really careful we're going to take some hot water kind of slide it inside and pour it in and what we're doing is we're Pasteurizing the wood pellets. We want to shoot kind of towards the middle, around one, one fifty, between 150 and 160. And all we're going to do is take the air out of the bag and fold it over. And we're going to let it sit overnight. What do they call these? <laughs> Drip mats for uh, your dishes. And just kind of wrap it up. Just cover it on top. And just let it sit there overnight. And once it's cool, you're going to end up with a bag of sawdust that's nice and hydrated. You don't want it too wet. If it's too wet, you're going to suffocate the mushrooms. Um, so what we want it to look like, it's going to be, still be really gritty, but it's still going to be wet. And if you squeeze it, you can kind of hear it like a sponge. And there's going to be like a, a little bit of, uh, you're going to hear the moisture inside of it. If you get a few drops, that's okay. But if you get a nice stream of water, no, that's too much water. Uh, so try it again um, and with a, a lesser amount of water. Some of the wood pellets are gonna take more water. Some are gonna take less to hydrate. Uh, so experiment with your wood pellets before you start making your bags. 
So this is some mushroom spawn. This is Pericium arenaceus. Uh, all the different mushrooms, the spawn's gonna look different. Different colors, different growth patterns. Uh, some are gonna look fluffy, some are gonna look really wispy like the lion's mane. Uh, so, my, so the lion's mane might actually have some fruit bodies growing on it. It's okay, just break up the fruit bodies with the spawn and, and uh, spawn with it as, you know, don't worry about the fruit bodies if there's any in the spawn. Uh, the colors can vary from orange to, um, you know, like a black. Uh, they can be a white, kind of grayish color. Um, but uh, for today, we have lion's mane. And this lion's mane is growing on oats. We're going to break it up to where all the kernels are in individual pieces. I want to break it all up. So spawn, uh, the rate of spawn that we're going to introduce needs to be a minimum of 3 to 5%, uh, all the way up to about 20%. Um, today, uh, we're going to use probably this half of this bag for this 5-pound block. And this is about 2 pounds of grain spawn. And uh, so the idea here is that we propagate mycelium on the grains. And then when we break them up, they disperse into the substrate to the point where they can grow and attach to each other very quickly. If we were to take one piece of grain and stick it in there, it would take a long time for it to grow all the way through the bag. And that's how it happens in nature. Uh, you know, you get one spore that germinates, meets up with another spore, and it takes a long time, almost six months, to colonize a substrate. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to speed that up. Uh, and what it also does is we're trying to get ahead of contamination. So if there is any other microbial activity in here, the more spawn we use, the better chances we're going to have of it colonizing the substrate before another competitor mold or bacteria uh, takes a hold. So. To inoculate the bag, just open it up, open your bag of spawn, pour it in. Save your spawn for later. You can um, tape the top of it and throw it back in the fridge. Gather the top of the bag up and just shake it up. That's it. It's kind of Knock all the, moist, the uh, extra sawdust off the side of the bag. If there's still some sticking on it, no big deal. Take the top of the bag, make sure that the filter patch doesn't get wound up where you're gonna cinch it, and just take a zip tie or you know, a, a twisty tie and just tie the top of it. And all you gotta do is just set that bag aside and in about two to three weeks, you'll see a lot of uh, mycelium start to coat the inside of the bag. And once it's pure white, you can fruit the bag. In the case of lion's mane, you can just make a hole about one inch down from the, uh, about, just take a knife and poke a slit in it. It only needs to be about a half inch to three quarters of an inch, about one inch down from the top of the substrate. And, um, and then set the bag into fruiting conditions and the lion's mane will come out and fruit on the outside of the bag. And when it's done, you can just twist it off and cook it up. So that's how you make a sawdust bag. I recommend doing it this way. It's just super simple. You can do it in the kitchen and uh, just makes it really easy. You can do it with the kids, um, do it as a couple together for fun, uh, date night. Um, so. Other mushrooms that you can use this way are Pleurotus syringii, the king oyster. You can do reishi mushrooms. Reishi is the same way. Once it colonizes, you just poke a little hole in the bag and it just comes out of the bag. Um, the king oysters most likely will fruit on top of the bag, so you have to cut the top of the bag off and stick it, stick it in a high humidity environment, like a little fruiting container, which I'll show you how to make. And uh, what else? Uh, we can do... Uh, uh, regular oyster mushrooms, yellow, pink, white, blue, gray, uh, 
Pleurotus pulmonarius, the summer oyster, and uh, uh, let's see what else. Um, shiitake mushrooms. Uh, shiitake mushrooms will be a lot different. Shiitake mushrooms need to colonize the substrate for a good two to three months. Um, what they do is they, they form a nice brown skin on the bag. Once the brown skin starts to develop and you start seeing fluid in the bag build up at the very bottom, they're ready to fruit. Uh, what you'll do is you'll take the bag and you'll stick it in the fridge and stick it in the fridge for a couple days and then pull it out, take the whole block out of the bag and agitate it by slapping it around and then set it inside of your fruiting container and all the mushrooms will start fruiting out of the out of the block. You'll see these little fissures open up. It's called blistering. And then uh, the fissures will open up and they'll look like white on the inside. And then the, the primordial will come out and uh, the rest of the shiitake will start fruiting. And it takes uh, about two, two and a half weeks for the whole fruiting cycle to, to get through its uh, little um, uh, set of uh, flush, um, which is what we call when a mushroom bag um, fruits, uh, we have one flush. Uh, usually shiitake, you can get two, two good flushes off of it. Oyster mushrooms can get up to three flushes. Um, as the flushes go on, uh, you'll get less and less mushrooms, but they'll get bigger and bigger, usually. So that's one way to make up a fruiting kit at home. Another way is to use some core. Uh, this is coconut core made from processing coconuts. Uh, there's tons of this stuff coming out of uh, Asian countries, uh, especially the Philippines. And uh, you can get it at a hydro shop, a gardening center. Uh, you can just buy little blocks online. Uh, it's fairly simple to make. You can also use straw. If you want to use the straw, you'll have to shred it up. You can buy pre-shredded straw sometimes at like tractor supply. Uh, but uh, if you want to shred it up and you don't have a, sh a shredder at home or a chipper, uh, you can just take a big tote, plastic tote, uh, put the straw inside and take your weed whacker and just stick it in there and just weed whack it all until it's nice and shredded. You can also just pile up a bunch of straw in your yard, run it over with the lawnmower, uh, if you have a bag attachment on your lawnmower, you can just have it like go right up into it and then pour it out. And uh, then you need to pasteurize it. So a word about the, <laughs> about the fuel pellets. So when they process these fuel pellets, they, there's a die in the machine. And it basically, there's a roller with a circular die and it, the die has a bunch of holes in it. And the sawdust goes into this die and this roller just runs over this die. And what happens, is it creates a lot of friction and as it extrudes the pellets out of this dye, it heats them up. So it's basically pasteurizing this, the sawdust pellets. So that's why I recommend using the sawdust pellets at home because they're already pretty much pasteurized when you get them, they're really clean. So all we have to do is just repasteurize them uh, just to be on the safe side. And, and, and it just makes it a lot easier to grow the mushrooms uh, without having to deal with too much contamination. The same thing happens when they do these core blocks. These core, core actually has beneficial microbes that kind of help protect the substrate itself. That's why a lot of uh, people who uh, grow plants and hydroponics like to use it because uh, it tends to not get funky real easily. And uh, so to pasteurize our material, whether it be straw or cardboard, if you have the cardboard, just cut it all up into little pieces, about one inch. Um, and it's good to mix the substrates together. So if you have a little bit of straw, a little bit of core, a little bit of newspaper or paper, uh, and just, just kind of mix them up uh, to give a nice open media, uh, a little bit of air inside. You don't want it to be like if you had a bunch of cardboard and it was flat, it probably get really like uh, matty, <clears throat> like a mat. And that's not good for the fungus. You want a little bit of air in there so the fungus has some breathing room because fungi breathe like we do. They breathe in oxygen, they use oxygen, and they release carbon dioxide after they digest their food. So uh, we want to make sure that the substrate is not too compact, not too wet. Um, so the way that we pasteurize the core or the straw is really easy. 
Go to Home Depot or Lowe's and they have these paint strainer bags. They come in a set of two, like three bucks, something like that. They use it to strain out dry paint out of um, paint, you know, uh, that's still in uh, usable form, but you don't want to brush the um, dry paint onto your surfaces. So it's just a nylon mesh bag. Nylon is, can take the heat. So all you want to do is just take this bag, throw your substrate inside, tie the top a little bit. You could use a, a twist tie or whatever. Tie it up, throw it in a buck, in a five gallon bucket. I'm going to take the one I pre-pasteurized out for you guys to show you. Just stick it in the bucket very carefully. Take some hot water that you uh, got to boiling and shut off. Wait about five minutes and then just pour it all in. The core is going to expand and the straw probably won't. It'll actually reduce in size. And uh, so what you're going to do if you have a plate that's big enough, you can kind of set it on top and then take something insulative like a towel or a couple of towels or some uh, hand mitts or whatever, whatever's gonna close up the top of the bucket. And it could even be the lid, but I still recommend putting some something insulative on top. It could be a piece of styrofoam and uh, let it sit for about an hour. Once, it's, once an hour has gone by, pull it out and set it somewhere where it can drain. In the case of core, you might have to squeeze a little bit of the moisture out. And um, in the case of straw, you're just gonna have to let it sit. Uh, once you get most of the water on the straw, you can set it on a piece of newspaper and the newspaper will absorb any, any extra moisture that kind of accumulates under it. Once we're done, we have a nice big bag of pasteurized substrate. We can pour it into a bowl. Before you get started, take a little bit of bleach solution, follow the directions. Uh, you can use alcohol as well, clean your area. So sanitize your area, follow the directions for surface disinfection. So whatever it says on the label, follow it to the T. Don't use too much, you don't, you don't need to. Um, I recommend alcohol or bleach, uh, diluted bleach, or you could use some Lysol surface disinfectant. Uh, I don't believe I have any of that, but uh, like all purpose, Lysol all pur purpose cleaner. I'm not talking about the spray. I'm talking about like the diluted uh, mix that you can buy for doing floors and cleaning surface, you know, like countertops and stuff. Um, clean your work area and depending on what you're fruiting. So if you're fruiting oyster mushrooms, I recommend doing it in a bag, an ice bag. Um, it could be um, just any bag that you can basically get your hand into. This one's a little small for the inside, but we can, we can deal with it. Um, it can even be a bag from like say Sprouts. Don't be afraid to use these bags. Uh, rinse it out before you do it. Spray it with a little bit of your surface bleach. It's okay to spray it with the bleach because uh, once you put the substrate in, it's going to dilute it enough to where it's not going to harm the mycelium. Um, so just kind of spray the inside of the bag with the bleach, let it sit for a little bit. And then, um, in fact, we'll use that for this. So we're going to imagine that I sprayed this with bleach. <laughs> so what we're going to do, we're going to take our spawn. In this case, I have some Agaricus blazii spawn. This is the almond portobello mushroom. Uh, it tastes and smells amazing, just like almonds. Uh, kind of reminiscent of like when you make like uh, uh, almond extract cookies in the house and the whole house starts smelling like almonds. This mushroom smells just the same. Tastes amazing. And it grows in the summertime. That's another thing that you probably want to consider is like we live in San Diego and the humidity levels in San Diego probably average about 30% humidity. So probably not ideal for, for cultivating mushrooms in. However, 
during this part of the year, we do get our rainy season, and it's a good time to do your fruiting and growing, grow your mushroom kits and uh, have a lot of fun with that. And um, so, uh, Garicus blazii fruits from the top. So I would recommend if you're doing uh, blazii to fruit it in a container such as this. Uh, you can get one of these at Home Depot. Um, you could also um, fruit it in a tray, say like this. Like this is for like sprouting grains in. Uh, you could place it in there and put some aluminum foil over there, over the top. Uh, poke some holes, a uh, few holes in it so it can breathe. And once it's colonized, you can take the foil off and stick it in your fruiting chamber and fruit it. If you're using oyster mushrooms, I recommend doing it in a bag. And once it's colonized, you can just poke a few holes in the bag and the mushrooms will actually come right out of this bag, uh, out of those holes. Uh, king oysters, uh, you could also do just like the blazy eye inside of a tub like this. Um, Rishi uh, mushrooms, I wouldn't recommend doing on core as well as the lion's mane. They don't really like to grow too well on core, uh, but oyster mushrooms, Agaricus blazii grows really well on it. Um, what else do we grow on core? Um, uh, of course, the, the summer oysters, like the pink oyster, yellow oyster, and the pulmonaris will grow readily on it as well. Um, but for the Rishi, Tremides, Versicolor, um, Lion's Mane, I'd stick with the sawdust. They love sawdust and they fruit really well on it. Um, so I'll show you how to inoculate substrate here. So all we're gonna do is just open up our substrate. First we break it up, the individual kernels. Open it up, put a little bag in. You can wear gloves. Um, if you don't want to waste gloves, uh, I'm sure there's not a lot of, gloves are pretty expensive right now. Just wash your hands with soap and water, 20 seconds, rinse for another 10 seconds, dry them up, and you're just, that's just fine. We're only pasteurizing the material, so we're not, this isn't sterile, it's just sanitary. And so um, take your hands and mix all your spawn into it. Smells like almonds right now. It's amazing. Even the mycelium smells. So I'm. Um, so if this was oyster mushrooms, uh, I would just dump it, mix it, dump it straight into the bag, tie the bag up, twist it nice and tight, and take a, a little thin nail and poke some holes in it so it can breathe. Set it in a nice cool dry or a cool uh, place uh, where it's not getting sunlight. Uh, you don't want it to get hot. You want it to keep it for oyster mushrooms. You want to keep it anywhere between 65 and 75 degrees. The blazy eye can take up to 85 degrees, anywhere between 70 and 85 degrees uh, during colonization. Uh, if you're going to fruit it outdoors. Uh, it can get a little hotter. It can be in the 90s. Um, it's kind of a warm weather mushroom. Pleurotus pulmonaris can fruit as well as the uh, pink oysters and uh, the yellow oysters, the cornucopia. Those mushrooms are tropical oysters and they can fruit in hot temperatures up like in 80s, 85 degrees. However, they fruit much better in cooler temperatures like in the, in the mid 70s. Uh, if you're fruiting winter oysters, you wanna keep it anywhere from between 60 and 75 degrees. Uh, they're gonna fruit better at a colder temperature. Um, if you're doing the Pleurotus eryngii, the king oyster, you wanna keep it on the cool side. Um, it, they, they, don't, they don't really like warm uh, weather. They don't fruit very well uh, in the warm weather. Um, so, we have our substrate. <clears throat> this is Agaricus blazii. We um, take our substrate, we put it in a bin. Don't pack it down. Just leave it nice and loose. Just kind of mix it around, get it nice and straight. 
take a towel and get all the extra substrate off the edge of the container. You can put a lid on and just poke some holes in the lid. They don't have to be big holes. Um, probably about a sixteenth of an inch uh, in diameter. Uh, put like six or seven holes on the top and take it and just set it in a nice cool place inside your house. Uh, out of the direct uh, sunlight, not by a window. You don't want it to heat up. Um, let it colonize. Once it turns white, you can stick it in your fruiting container and just give it a little misting uh, here and there every day, maybe twice, maybe three times a day, just whenever you think about it, when you walk by it. Um, and uh, with the blazy eye in about a month, month and a half, it'll start fruiting with the oysters, like they'll start fruiting in, in almost three weeks. Um, uh, Rishi will start fruiting in about 30 days or so. If you were doing a shiitake block, like I said, it takes a good three months uh, to do that. Um, like I said, the shiitake blocks will be ready when you start seeing fluid develop in the bottom of the bag. This like uh, reddish, brownish fluid. And um, you'll take that out, again, you'll take it out. Just kind of rinse it off under the water, um, stick it in the fridge, let it cool off for a couple of days at a low temperature to cold shock it. Pull it out, slap it around. Um, you don't have to use your hands. You could just grab a spatula, just kind of hit the, hit the outside of the block a little bit, and then stick it inside of your fruiting container and let it fruit. Uh, to fruit the substrate, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to do this at the how, in home, because here in San Diego, obviously, it's, it's not a good place outside to fruit mushrooms except for maybe shiitake because they like to fruit here in the summertime in the shade on their on logs and as well as the reishi. The reishi can take uh, higher temperatures. Um, reishi can tolerate up into the 80, 80 degrees. However, a word about humidity. Uh, so the hotter the air temperature gets, the more moisture holding capacity it has. So when the air is is say 60 degrees, it's, it's really easy to humidify the air because it doesn't hold a lot of, of moisture in the air. Uh, however, when you move up into like 80 degrees, it's gonna take three times that amount of moisture to, to make the humidity high and allow the mushrooms to fruit. So you kinda like try to focus on getting in between those temperatures um, and just kinda like, uh, you know, getting the most, the most uh, humidity as you possibly could. Um, to produce humidity in the, in, the, in the house, we can use what we call a shotgun box. So get yourself a container. Nice big tote. Nice big tote. The bigger the better, actually. Um, the reason for it being uh, if you have a large tote, like say this long, it has a lot more oxygen inside uh, as, compo as opposed to a smaller tote. However, this tote, this size tote, would be fine for fruiting maybe two blocks maximum. Uh, I recommend just one. Um, so they call it a shotgun, shotgun box because it looks like it has a bunch of holes in it, like someone shot a, shot, a bunch of uh, bird shot through there. And um, so get yourself either one eighth or quarter inch uh, drill and drill a gazillion holes in it, as many as you can. Um, do the bottom, the sides. You don't have to do the top, but you can. Uh, while I have this tote here, so I did this to show you both. So a shotgun box will have all the holes in it. Another uh, version of uh, fruiting is called a monotub. In a monotub, we'll have a couple like big three quarter inch to one inch holes. You can cover them with some micropore tape, which is like surgical tape. You can get it at Walgreens or CVS or something. Uh, anywhere they have a pharmacy, you'll find it. Uh, it's kind of like a filter tape. It, ha it acts like a filter. And um, what, what you can do, uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, lately growing reishi in it. Uh, reishi, reishi, when grown in a high CO2 environment, produces uh, what they call the antler form of the reishi. Uh, it doesn't 
get sessile like the ones that you see outdoors where it's just kind of like a big plain cap. Uh, so instead you'll get these like antlers and they look like big worms, uh, reddish, yellow and, and blackish worms that fruit up. And those fruit bodies are just as good as the, the, the sessile uh, type of uh, fruitings. Um, what you can do is when you make up your sawdust substrate, you can still do it in the bag. Uh, instead though, you're gonna take all that substrate and you're gonna pour it inside of here. You're gonna make sure that the holes are more than four inches up from the bottom of the container and mix all your spawn in. More spawn, the better. Uh, smooth it all out. Again, don't pack it because uh, you want some air uh, to be exchanged through the substrate and pour it all in there. And this is kind of like a set it and forget it type of um, apparatus. You'll put it, all your spawn, all your substrate in there after you pasteurize it, close it up and just let it sit. It'll colonize the substrate. And um, once it colonizes, it'll sit there and kind of go into a little dormancy period for maybe a week or two. And then you'll start to see fruit bodies develop. You still don't have to open it up at that time unless you see it kind of drying out inside. If you do, Take a spray bottle, uh, set the tip to where it sprays a nice mist, and mist the inside. Now, you don't want to mist it until it gets like really wet and soppy inside. You just want to mist it to where there's little water droplets just sitting on top of the substrate. Because um, mushrooms don't actually absorb moisture from the air. They actually release it. So what, what we're trying to do is conserve the moisture in the air and allow them so you don't want to you don't want too much evaporation to occur off the fruit bodies so the less evaporation uh, is occurring um, you know the mushrooms aren't going to dry out uh, so you want to keep the humidity high in there and that's going to be done by the substrate itself inside of here so we're allowing a little bit of air exchange once the uh, once the substrate is colonized, you can actually take this micro, a couple of these micropore, pieces of micropore tape off a couple holes inside to increase the amount of air exchange that's going into the, into the container. And then um, that's it. Just let them fruit. Uh, you could also do the Eryngii like that. They can fruit in high CO2 environments. In fact, the Eryngii you buy in the store, the big ones that look like the big bowling pins, they're actually grown in high CO2 environments uh, like that. If you grow them in uh, more atmospheric levels of oxygen and CO2 levels, they, uh, they actually fruit more like an oyster where they kind of like plane out. Uh, but yeah, uh, the reishi, the uh, king oysters you can grow inside of a monotub. Um, what else could you? Uh, you can grow regular oyster mushrooms in there like that and just fruit them off the top. But once they start fruiting, you might want to give them a little bit more air because oyster mushrooms require more oxygen. So you just open the lid and just kind of cock it a little bit and just watch inside. If it's drying out too much, just kind of close it up a little bit more and just mist it every day. The other method is if we're making sawdust blocks or bags, we can also just do the shotgun box. So the shotgun box is a little bit different. We're going to make a humidity chamber. You can take your, the bag that you bought, uh, the uh, nylon paint strainer bag, throw a bunch of coarse perlite. I know this isn't coarse, but this is all I had. Um, put some coarse perlite in there. The medium perlite's fine. The, the fine perlite probably isn't going to work that great. Um, so uh, take it. Put it in your paint strainer bag, put it in the sink, get it nice and wet, uh, turn your faucet on. You could actually sanitize your sink, fill it with water, and just kind of dip it in there, let it drain out, and then pour it inside of your shotgun box, box like this. You want to get, you want to get about four inches of perlite in there or so. And yes, you, you, you want to have holes on the bottom, on the sides. You want air to be able to come inside. And what happens here is all this wet perlite, we just took a, 
small space inside of this container and increase the amount of surface area that the water can evaporate from by placing the perlite in there. So as the air gently comes into the container, it starts evaporating this water and creating a nice humidified environment above the perlite. And all you have to do is just take your kit, poke your holes in it after it's colonized and just set it in here and the mushrooms will come out and fruit right inside of the container. You can do this inside of your house. Uh, the only requirement is that there has to be some kind of air movement inside the house. It doesn't have to be a lot. It could just be like your air conditioning, moving the air inside the house. You could have, you could have a door open or a window, just kind of a little breeze, because uh, that breeze is gonna come through these holes and pick up that moisture and then take it up into the top part of this container and give your mushrooms a nice humidified environment to fruit from. Very simple. Like I said, you don't have to put holes in the lid. Uh, some people like to make a couple of these and then stack them. So you don't want any excess moisture dripping down on the mushrooms themselves. If you do have to spray the mushrooms, they look kind of dry. Again, it's just like spraying the mycelium. You just want to spray it enough to where you see like little micro uh, droplets sitting on the cap. Let those evaporate first before you mist it again. And as long as you do that and, and keep it nice and humid, the mushrooms will fruit just fine. I'm going to show you how to make uh, a shiitake black or reishi black or Tremedes versicolor black um, or uh, lion's mane. You could also do uh, foliotas, um, however uh, they fruit in some colder weather. Uh, we could also do um, uh, brick caps. Um, there's many other mushrooms, but the ones that I recommend here in San Diego, just because we have a warm climate, are the reishi, the hericium. Hericium actually grows here while in the wild on oak trees. And um, Tremedes versicolor grows here as well in the springtime um, and the fall. But the most common one is shiitake. So join me outside and we're going to show you how to create your own uh, shiitake log. Okay, here we are outside. Uh, I'm going to show you how to inoculate a shiitake taki block. You can also do reishi and lion's mane like this. You're going to want some sawdust on your, as well as the shiitake and the uh, reishi. It needs to be in the form of sawdust. Uh, the way we're going to do this, we're going to drill holes inside of the log about six inches apart, four to six inches apart, staggered all the way around the block. And what we're going to use is a plug inoculator, just like this. It has a little hole in the end of the shaft and something to push the spawn into the hole with. Um, they also sell birch dowels that are already inoculated with, uh, with the mushroom itself and you can just pound them into the holes and then cover them with wax. You can use paraffin wax, you can use a mixture of beeswax and paraffin or just beeswax itself. Um, doesn't really matter. Um, they all work pretty much similar. If you don't like the idea of using paraffin wax, go ahead and just buy yourself some beeswax candles and melt them down and you can use that. So all you're going to need is your wax. You're going to heat up the wax inside of a little can outside or on your stove and bring it out uh, to wherever you're working. You'll need a little brush to apply the wax over the holes to seal the holes um, with. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we have our our spawn with us. I'm going to open the bag up, just get it ready. You don't have to squeeze it or break it up or anything, just leave it just like it is. You can use a drill bit, just make sure that the drill bit is exactly the same size or a little bit bigger than your plug inoculator or, or in the case of the dowels, just try to make sure it's pretty much the same size as the, as the dowels because you're going to be beating it into the hole. Uh, I prefer to use a grinder with this bit attachment. These little bits can be purchased online at a lot of the mushroom supply houses. Stamets has uh, fungi.com. You can get bits and spawn. Uh, you can get, uh, who else? Uh, um, 
Field and Forest is a good place. They have all the supplies and, and spawn you're going to need to make your log. Uh, so what we're going to do is, you know, use some safety glasses. In this case, I had this available. Um, just going to use a little shield here. And we're going to drill every four to six inches. We're going to stagger them. The more holes you use, the easier it's going to be for the uh, mushrooms to take a hold, just like the spawn inside of our substrate. The more you use, the quicker it's going to come together, the quicker it's going to get a hold of or ahead of the contamination and colonize the whole, the whole log. So we're going to drill it out a little bit. So uh, now we have our holes uh, in the log. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm just doing this as a demo for you guys. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to take our bag of spawn. We're going to take the plug inoculator and we're just going to punch it straight into the spawn so that we fill the end of the plug inoculator with the spawn. We're going to push it in the hole. Once you get all of your holes filled, you're going to take your wax and just use a little can. Cool enough. And we're going to coat the outside of the holes with the wax. Just going to seal up these holes so that the spawn doesn't dry out. Another thing I didn't mention, you might want to like make sure that you put enough spawn into the holes to where it's nice and flush at the outside uh, before you put the wax on because otherwise you're going to have to keep turning you know, the log and try to fill in, you know, wasting a lot of wax trying to fill in the holes. Um, once you have all of those, uh, all the holes waxed up and sealed, uh, I feel that like it's a really good idea to paint the ends of the logs. So if you have any extra like exterior uh, paint or even interior paint uh, like flat or gloss doesn't matter uh, just paint the ends of the logs to kind of help keep the moisture inside uh, so they don't dry out too much and then all you have to do is stick this log um, under a, a good tree to stick it under is like a nice big avocado tree with a lot of lush leaves uh, I like fig fig trees work really well um, uh, just any place maybe on the on the north side of your building that gets shade all day you don't want to put them in the sun you can actually build a little shade hut with some uh, PVC pipe in the ground use some uh, use some uh, pieces of rebar and just bend some PVC pipe down put a shade cloth over the top and all you have to do is just put like a little mister uh, you can go to Home Depot and they have those little mister wands that just kind of sit on the ground and put it on a timer and let it uh, miss the room maybe twice a day, get it nice and wet, just keep the area moist and cool. And in about six months, you'll start to see mycelium start growing out of the edges of the bark on, on, the, on the wood. And once that happens, it's almost ready to fruit. Uh, so just kind of increase the watering intervals and keep the, the, the logs wet. Um, not too wet, you don't want like to soak them or anything. Uh, just, just so that they look moist but not like pools of water sitting in between the bark. Um, and then uh, let them fruit out. Shiitake, like to, uh, if you get some warm weather shiitake strain, uh, it'll fruit right in the middle of the winter time or the summertime, the, the beginning and the end of summertime sometimes. Uh, if you're going to inoculate them in the fall, I'd get a, like a winter, uh, uh, a winter uh, strain. Uh, that'll fruit in the cold weather. Just depends on where you are here in San Diego. Uh, like I said, most of the year it's going to be hot. Um, so find yourself a nice, cool, shady area to put your log in. The reishi like the heat. They're going to they're going to fruit more in the summer, early summer uh, periods, uh, as as well as the, the shiitake usually fruits in the the beginning of the summer when it just starts warming up, uh, not when it's like super hot. Um, Tremedes, same thing. Types of wood. So here in San Diego, we're kind of limited. There's a lot of pepper trees that get cut down. Uh, you can use pepper for the Tremedes and the Rishi. In fact, Rishi grow wildly here on, on pepper trees. We have a Ganoderma called Ganoderma polychromum, which grows on 
almost every pepper tree I've ever seen in San Diego at some point. And uh, for the shiitake, I recommend uh, barked uh, eucalyptus trees uh, wood and uh, oak wood. Um, this is a piece of ash that we uh, cut down earlier uh, that I wanted to get out of my, off my property. Uh, the ash will fruit, usually get maybe one or two fruitings off it. It'll, it'll, it'll digest really fast. Uh, the oak, you're gonna get fruitings for probably three years or so uh, before it starts to die off. Uh, you'll want to select a, 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 a log that's anywhere from 4 inches to 12 inches in diameter. Uh, anything in between there is like ideal, uh, but we've fruited uh, shiitake on up to 14 inch diameter logs here. The, the thing is, is that the larger logs are going to take much longer to colonize. could take up to a year uh, before they start fruiting, but with the, once they start fruiting, you'll start getting uh, at least two fruitings a year. Um, so. Yeah, just keep them in a nice cool place, let them colonize for a nice good six, seven months. And uh, for the big logs, it might take longer, like I said. And um, good luck. Thank you guys for uh, joining me in this cultivation demo. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the, the chat boxes or contact me directly through the SD uh, Myco um, Society. And uh, we do host classes during the year. Um, we'll be trying to do some laboratory classes, uh, culture work, uh, hands-on uh, bed making for stropharia mushrooms and, and button mushrooms outdoors. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for these announcements. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate it. See you later. Hi, sweethearts. I'm Michelle Innes. I've been part of the San Diego Mycological Society since, well, Sam gave a lecture at the gardener's thing and I started the interest there probably about 2014. And uh, my husband Jack and I are pretty active members of the club, except for right now, but that's okay. Um, we have grown shiitake mushrooms for many years and I just wanted to share with you some of my little babies that are growing right now. We'll harvest a few and show you what they look like. Okay, I wanna show you some of my babies. They're kind of all over these logs, so you have to kind of come around and give them a little, oh, it would be nice, the sharp part. <laughs> so the shiitake's come in all kinds of sizes and shapes and so I bring them and I leave them upside down when they're sitting in the in the basket because then I can put it out in the sun for a little while and that increases your vitamin D that they absorb. So I come down every couple of days and bump my head a couple of times and harvest mushrooms and when I dry them I dry them in my 1951 O'Keefe and Merritt stove with the pilot light and when I can pop off the stem then I know they're dry enough and I save the stems and I make broth out of those. So let's see if we want to get any other that are a little big. Oh here's some. <laughs> now these logs were harvested at the same time as we did the uh, mushroom class out at, what was the name of the ranch? The Creekside. Creekside. Um, so these were the extra large logs that were gonna be really a lot, a lot uh, longer to mature. But now this is ages later and there are fresh shiitakes popping all over the place. Oh Mushrooms is all about amazing, functional, whole food, organic mushrooms with life-changing health benefits. They're very, very effective in helping with brain health, gut health, with sports performance, and with recovery. The cordyceps really gives me a lot of energy. I am 55 years old and I feel like 15. 
We have such high standards, I mean, crazy high standards. At our facilities here in Southern California, we grow 11 different species, uh, certified 100% organic in a highly controlled indoor environment. What is unique about old mushrooms is that we harvest the whole life cycle of the mushrooms. You get a much more broader array of active ingredients and nutrition. We want to make things easy for the consumer, easy in how you can take it every day, easy in how you can understand what mushrooms should I take or what products should I take. When you buy OM, you're getting the best. Hi, I'm Eric Mueller from Mueller's Mushrooms. I've been growing mushrooms for over 20 years now. And now we have our tabletop mushroom farm, so you too could be a mushroom farmer. We have lion's mane grow kits and oyster mushroom grow kits. Super delicious, uh, made with uh, certified organic materials. And you can pretty much just grow these anywhere, right on a tabletop, on a shelf, uh, on a sink, sometimes bathroom or laundry. Has enough little humidity in there. This is an example of our delicious uh, oyster mushrooms, which is also used for our wonderful mushroom jerky. Uh, these oyster mushrooms are actually quite medicinal too. In lab animals, they say it's carrying lymphoma and other cancers and tumors uh, in lab animals. We also have a line of medicinal mushroom tinctures and extracts for health and wellness, memory focus, some of them for energy, anti-inflammatory. And all these products are pretty much available at our website at MuellersMushroom.com. If you'd like to pick up a tabletop mushroom farm, you can send a DM to my Instagram, Mueller's Mushrooms. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bonnie Thorson, and I've been with the San Diego Mycological Society over 20 years. I was very lucky because my introduction to the Young Mushroom Club coincided with a new series of opportunities for me to hunt wild mushrooms in some pretty hot spots. First, I'd started finding colorful and different species in the mountainous national parks of northern Baja, California. And about then, I also began spending time every year in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a mushroomer's paradise. San Diego Mycological Society has been a fantastic resource for me from the start, fostering education, camaraderie, and volunteerism in the interest of studying fungi. We owe the club's official creation to the vision and backing of Dr. Elio Schechter. For years, he's challenged members to really study the fungi, both macroscopic and microscopic features. I followed his advice with so many mushrooms and was rewarded with some good knowledge, but especially the fun surrounding it all. Elio has continued to inspire us over the years, leading forays or giving presentations in classes. While we've had a long lineup of dedicated presidents and board members in our history, he, maintained, he remains a generous figure sharing his knowledge, skills, and thoughts, promoting all things mushroom. Now it's our great pleasure to announce that San Diego Mycological Society has paired with the University of California to fund their Graduate Microbiology Award for Excellence in Mycology in honor of our club's founder, Dr. Moselio Schechter. In recognition of his long career devoted to academic microbial research, as well as his promotion of mushrooming as a hobby, we commend and thank Elio by inaugurating our annual scholarship award in his name, the Dr. 
Elio Schechter Graduate Mycological Scholarship. And now a bit about him personally. Dr. Moselio Schechter, Elio, was born in Milan, Italy, and at age 12, he and his parents found refuge as European Jews in Ecuador. When he was 14, an interest in microbiology was inspired after he read Microbe Hunters by Paul de Cruyff. Studies in high school and medical school, plus his work in bacteriology laboratories, led him in 1950 to the University of Kansas and the University of Pennsylvania for graduate degrees. He was soon drafted and served in the U.S. Army doing microbial research at Walter Reed, later spending time in Denmark doing postdoctoral work. After his first job at the University of Florida Medical School, in 1962, Elio joined Tufts University in Boston for a 33-year career, chairing their Department of Molecular Biology for 23 years. He also served as president of the American Society for Microbiology in 1985 and 6. It was in Boston that Elio began his serious interest in mycology as a hobby and joined the micro, excuse me, the Boston Mycological Club, the oldest amateur mushroom club in the United States, where he actively participated and led for years. It is San Diego's great fortune that when he left when Elio left Boston in 1995, life brought him here. Before long, he helped organize San Diego Mycological Society. He's been a great inspiration and teacher to many over the years. And while he's never left academia, he maintains teaching positions at both San Diego State University and University of California, San Diego. Elio loves writing and besides authoring dozens of scientific papers and classic microbiology books, in 1997, his delightful book, In the Company of Mushrooms, was published by the Harvard University Press. About 20 years ago, Elio and a few like-minded folks joined efforts and started compiling an online collection of mostly European classical artworks depicting mushrooms. A few years ago, North American, excuse me, North American Mycological Association adopted and incorporated the Registry of Mushrooms in Works of Art. In 2006, he helped originate the popular blog, Small Things Considered, published by the American Society for Microbiology, with which Elio and co-bloggers continue to share appreciation of Earth's microbes, which of course sometimes features fungi. <clears throat> Elio's life is an amazing story, and for more of it, I recommend a look at his Wikipedia page and the external links section, including his personal memoirs, Small Things Considered blog, and other video uh, interviews. Elio stands as a treasure in our club, and we're pleased to recognize his great works through creating this Mycology Award at UC Riverside. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Sydney Glassman. I'm a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Plant Pathology at the University of California, Riverside. And we have about 20 faculty members in our department and we study microbes and their importance in agriculture, pathosystems, the environment, and in humans. And of course, we study fungi. We study fungi in many aspects. We study their genetics, their genomics, their pathology, their interactions with each other, with plants and the environment. And of course, mycorrhizal fungi, which are mutualistic fungi associated with plants. And I'm very happy today to introduce my PhD student, Bobby Paluto Chavez, who is a third year plant pathology graduate student in my lab. She has been studying the bacterial and fungal responses to chaparral wildfires in Southern California. And she is the recipient of the first annual UC Riverside Microbiology Award for Excellence in Mycology. Hi everyone, thank you very much. I wanna thank the San Diego Society for granting me this award. Um, I am very grateful and this allows me to continue and to uh, share my research with general public. So currently what we are working on, as Dr. Glassman mentioned, we're working on understanding the effects of wildfire on fungi and bacteria in a chaparral ecosystem. So what we're doing is like, we want to figure out how this fungi and bacteria respond to fires, how they're changing over time, so their succession. And we want to figure out like how, um, how and if they will ever return to their unburned level. So this is very, very well known for plants. We understand how they change over time. We understand 
how they replace each other, but we don't know this for fungi or bacteria. So this is one thing that we're looking into, and this is at the Holy Fire and the El Dorado Fire, the 2018-2019 fire. Um, and another thing that we're really, really interested about and we're really excited about is being able to not only figure out which type of fungi or species, species and genus are present, but we're really excited about figuring out what they're doing in the ecosystem. So how they're using up the, the new carbon sources, how they're utilizing the changes in nitrogen, um, because this is in order to understand how they're able to restore the system. Um, so, so we're able to use a new set of tools called metagenomics. So it's kind of a mouthful, but metagenomics allows us to find all the DNA or all the genes, so the genomes of all the fungi and bacteria. So pretty much everything in the system. And then we're able to um, figure out what they're doing. So this allows us to identify their species. So genes, their, sorry, their species and their genus, and it allows us to figure out what they're doing, so their function. Um, and we're hoping that we're able to use this information to understand how we can maintain the system and how we can restore the system, potentially using some of these microbes, if we understand how their, their succession in the system. Very excited. This has been a dream of mine for several years, and, and I appreciate uh, partnering with UC Riverside and uh, finally getting this launched. And congratulations, Fabiola. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. And UC Riverside, my department is very excited to partner with you. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, to the Mushroom Fair. I'm giving a talk to you about mushrooms through the ages. My name is Elio Schechter. Okay, let's, start. let's get started. First of all, what is a toadstool? Well, this is a toadstool, right? Does it look like a toadstool? Okay, the word toadstool is not a scientific term. It's a, it, it, some people call toadstools poisonous mushrooms. Other, others call any mushroom a toadstool. It doesn't matter. Okay, so how old are they? Well, here's a picture of a humongous fungus. What you see here is what appears to be a fungus and it's humongous. It's 20 to 30, 35 million years old. A reproduction of what it may have looked like is like this. In the early Devonian period, about 400 million years ago, years ago, this was the dominant figure, the dominant living thing on Earth. It looked like uh, rockets, I guess. Anyhow, we don't know much about it, but this is apparently a fungus. If you cut through it, it, it looks like a fungus and it's about 400 million years ago, okay. About uh, 20 to uh, 100 million years ago, we find mushrooms in amber. Amber, as you know, is a way that preserves fossils very well. Here you have a tiny little mushroom in amber, here you have a little bigger one. And it's got these striations, which are very typical of many mushrooms today. So there were mushrooms quite a while ago, right? How about people? Well, this is a, a sculpture, is a painting, a war painting from Algeria from about 7,000 years ago. We don't know if these things were mushrooms or not. They certainly look a little bit like them, but they're funny to, to have them all over the body. If these were mushrooms, this is the worst, worst case of athletes for it, right? Anyhow. More uh, closer to our time, if you remember there was a, in, some years ago, uh, people, hikers in the, uh, in the Alps found an ice man, which was, which was mummified. And his name was given the name of Otzi because Otzi is the glacier where he was found. He had a lot of things with him. This on the left is a reconstruction of what he had. And among his things, were in this toolkit were these things which are fungi. What they were there for is not clear. There's a lot of discussion about whether this was medicinal or a talisman or just what. But he, uh, it apparently the birch polypor, which is, could be used for staunching blood. Maybe he used it for medicinal purposes. Anyhow, these are 
my, my fungi, we, we can call them mushrooms if you want to, it doesn't matter. These are not, as I say, we don't use this in a technical sense. Anyhow, these are fungi which grow on the size of trees. And you can find them in our area. This is not uncommon. So how old in, in terms of our, our civilization, how far back can you find mushrooms? Well, in a fresco in Herculaneum, Herculaneum is a place near Pompeii, which got covered with the ashes of the Vesuvius in the eruption of 1 AD. You find a, uh, oh no, later than that. Anyhow, you find a fresco which shows a, uh, some partridges uh, and some mushrooms. These mushrooms are recognizable to, as Lactarius deliciosos. Mushrooms have uh, Latin names, as you can imagine. Uh, Lactarius is the genus name and deliciosos is the species name. This is a mushroom which is eaten in the Mediterranean to date, and you find something like it, very similar to it, around here in San Diego. It's quite good to eat. This is what it looks like. So you can see it's very close to what the artist painted in 1 AD. Uh, the Romans were good at mushrooming, and here you have a collection of mushrooms which uh, you can recognize as a mushroom called a porcini mushroom. The whole collect, why they're lined up so, I don't know, but the mosaicists like to do that. It's from, the, from France, but it's a Roman mosaic. In this uh, continent, we find that uh, mushrooms were used in for, probably for sacred purposes. Um, the Spaniards, when they arrived here, started a thing called a codex, which is sort of a description in pictures of what they saw here. And so here you have a god, a god uh, touching or doing something with a person, the person is holding something that looks like a mushroom. And if you don't believe it, that's a mushroom, they painted next to it something which really does look like mushrooms. So it's probably. Uh, the use of mushrooms for probably for food and for divinatory purposes, for sacred purposes, were here since probably, we have another one, let's see. Again, this, this god is holding what looks like mushrooms. This goes back to about the first century AD. Uh, there are stone carvings of mushrooms in the Maya civilization. These are Mayan mushroom stones. And to this day, they were used for divinatory purposes. Uh, a famous curandera, a shaman, by name of Maria Sabina, is shown here. She would use mushrooms, she would eat the mushrooms, hallucinogenic mushrooms, and go into a trance. And this was useful because she could divine the future. She could tell us what was gonna happen. Uh, this was made popular by a, uh, uh, this, this by the way is the most, uh, the most typical mushroom there is. This is the uh, idea, if you ask a kid to paint a mushroom, the chances are they'll paint a red mushroom with white dots. It's called the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria. Again, the genus name is Amanita, the species name is muscaria. So what does it do? Well. It gives you a trip, all right, but, the trip, but since it's poisonous, the trip is going to be to the emergency room. And you, you find the church is showing Amanita muscaria as the paradigm of a mushroom. There's a fairy sitting on top of one, a gnome here, and another Santa Clausy like figure sitting on top of Amanita muscaria. Um, this, the, uh, this shows a guardian angel showing the kids which mushrooms are poisonous. So these are different mushrooms. These look like porcini mushrooms to me. There's one porcini, another porcini, but these are Manita muscaria. And Manita muscaria is not good to eat. So the holy uh, angel uh, warns uh, not to eat poisonous mushrooms. This one, widespread. 
Let's go on to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there's not an awful lot because the Middle Ages were, of course, the Dark Ages. But St. Augustine, of all people, who lived in the fourth century AD, said something very interesting. The robber takes from you with a fever or an adder or a poisonous mushroom can take. He lies the whole power of the rage of men to do what a mushroom can. Men eat poisonous mushrooms and they die. This is the kind of stuff you find from the Middle Ages. It's not very sanguine, not very cheerful. But Albertus Magnus, who was an advocate of peaceful, peaceful coexistence between science and religion in the 13th century, had a work called De Vegetabilibus, where he said, it is called the mushroom of flies because crushed in milky fierce flies. We're going back to Amanita muscaria. Why muscaria, by the way, means of the mushroom. So what's the story? Uh, Albertus Magnus said you crush it in milk and it kills flies. Turns out this was not the case. This is not the case. It does not kill the mushrooms, the flies. But if you have, uh, if you make some of the amanita crushed in milk, it will attract flies. And because it's hallucinogenic, the flies get woozy. And now they can be swab. You can, you can, uh, you can kill them because you can catch them. That's, that's what happens. But amanita is called amanita muscaria of the fly in practically every language. Uh, in the Middle Ages, in the year 1050, the Byzantine Empress Zoe Porphyrogenita, which means born to the cloth, to the purple cloth, died of a fever at the age of 72. And the Emperor Constantine insisted that the growth of a mushroom on her grave was a miracle, showing that the soul was numbered among the angels. So mushrooms were not all bad. Here's a cartoon that shows you what mushrooms can do. Uh, this is contemporary, of course. Somebody left? Okay. Famous among the pictures in the Middle Ages is a fresco from an abbey in France, Plain Couro, from 1291. So what is this? This looks like a collection of mushrooms but coming out of a single stem like that, which is very strange. This is Adam and this is Eve, by the way. So what are they? So uh, people, a lot of people think these are mushrooms. Notice that the cap trifurcates, which is very strange. This is not what you normally think of as a mushroom, but people think it is. Now, uh, I have to call your attention to the fact that uh, mushrooms appear in works of art. And a bunch of us have put together a registry of mushrooms in works of art. And you can find it by Googling registry mushrooms and get you there. There are about 40, 1500 entries, mainly from the Western world. The reason I make that point is because there are a lot of mushrooms in, illustra in illustrations from the, from the East, from Japan and China. However, we did not include those in our registry because we don't know anything about them. And since we don't, cannot read Japanese or Chinese, it's not fair to put them in because we don't know what to do. Whereas the rest of the, the Western mushrooms that we have in the registry are annotated, we say something about them, and you can find out what it is. So this is the kind of stuff we have. From the middle, the late Middle Ages, 16, nearly 14, the year 1400, uh, there is a tapestry which shows a horseman. Uh, this is the black horse and the famine. This is the famine, I guess. This is the black horseman, which is not shown, but here are mushrooms. Well, let me say that when we started out, we thought we would learn a lot about the meaning of mushrooms in works of art. I must say we're disappointed. There's very little symbolic 
it shows up when you look at mushrooms and works of art. They're there. They seem to be there along with flowers and plants. There's not much to say about it. However, we'll try. And here is a from a book, a, a man gathering truffles. Well, the truffles he's gathering are almost the size of a head of a human being. No truffle is that big. And they grow on ledges, which is not the way you find uh, mushrooms. So not everything that you find from the 14th century or thereabouts is accurate. But you find a Madonna holding a mushroom. You can't see it very well, but she's holding a mushroom here in a church in Spain. And there's a whole collection of Madonnas with child which show mushrooms. In the Renaissance, we find a birth of interest in science and of course in mushrooms. It is the first book, first illustration in the book from 1491. It's called Hortus Sanitatis, the, the Garden of Health. And this shows a bunch of mushrooms. There's no question that there are mushrooms, which ones they are, I must say I'm hard to tell. I'm hard put to tell. It'd be very difficult to really make out what they are. But this is the man who started scientific mycology, a Dutchman, my name is Adrian de, de Jong from the world. Yeah. Uh, he, he was, uh, blah, 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 blah. never mind that. He's from the 15th, from the 16th century. And he wrote a book, the first book written on mushrooms called Folly. The apartment translation is Folly, a description of pictures of life of the fungi growing, occasionally signs of Holland by Adrianus Junius. His name is De Jong, but Latinized, the camera came out as Adrian. Anyhow, what is this about? Well, there are fungi which look like penises. And here it is. It's called Hadriani after Hadrianus, and it looks like a phallus. So, what's this all about? Well, a mushroom is a a way, a way of spores making more spores. Mushrooms make spores in large amounts. And this is one way to disperse them. Uh, this gray mass on top of the mushroom is a collection of spores. And they're wet, so they don't spread through the air like, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. These are very smelly. They smell to, like carrions. You can mistake being in the presence of, the, of one of these mushrooms with, with, with 10, 10 feet. And so this attracts flies. The flies land on this, they eat some of it, and they get this, this is sticky stuff to get it on their legs. So they fly away, and when they land, the spores are, are spread to a new site. This is a picture from the book of uh, Hadrian. Uh, it's very telling. In the, uh, somewhere in around 1500, we find a picture of the three ages of women, young, middle, and old. And here is a tree with fungi growing on it. So we begin to see illustrations of mushrooms like that. And this is a very good one. This is a picture of Bruegel, there are several Bruegels, this is Peter the Elder, and it's called Visit to a Farmhouse. It's around the middle, of, let's say the middle of the 16th century. And here's a cauldron over the fire, and there are mushrooms in it. Uh, the way people ate, by the way, in the Middle Ages, uh, was not to sit down at dinner or lunch or breakfast, but simply to have a cauldron with food cooking all day long. And whenever you were hungry, you just went to it and helped yourself. But here is unmistakably the use of mushrooms in the 16th century. In the Baroque time, we see a lot. In the North, there's an unknown Italian painter who goes by the name of Sudo Fardella. There was a painter called, Sudo, called Fardella, and this guy is called Sudo Fardella because nobody knows who he was. But this is a still life 
showing mushrooms. These are porcini mushrooms, undoubtedly. Well, this may not be, this is, uh, this is Caesar's mushroom. But these are porcini because you can see, maybe you can make it out. Instead of having gills, partitions, lamellae, they have pores. And the, 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 here's asparagus and some cherries and some prunes and apples and who knows what else. This is typical of middle of uh, Baroque, the Baroque period. And there are hundreds of these, or lots of them. And there's also a guy, a Dutchman, by the name of Otto Marcius van Schrich. And Marcius painted scenes in the woods, in the understory. This is in Italian, it's called the Sotto Bosco style, pictures of the under. And they're kind of macabre, they look, they look very tenable. Here are moths, butterflies, snail, and mushrooms. And he did a lot of this. Marcius, uh, was, although he was a Dutchman, he went to Italy. There's a lot of people from Northern Europe went to Italy in the uh, 17th century. And we became part of a school of naturalist painters. And he started his paintings in the all over in the many museums. Here's another one by him. You can see this mushroom here, which looks like Caesar's mushroom. This is a bolit, that is a, a the porcini, in the family, the porcini mushrooms. And here is something called a uh, coral mushroom. You have a snake, a toad, moths, and so on. Now, he never saw all the, and the flower of some sort, there's another snake. He never saw all this in reality under, under the trees. He made, he must have made sketches of these things, taking him to his study and painting him there. So he was a, he wanted to depict nature in its raw form. Uh, there was, some funny stuff too. There's a guy in the name of Archimboldo, an Italian from the late 16th century. And he painted figures made up of apples, and, uh, uh, chestnut, and gourd, and for an ear, he had a mushroom. I don't know what that is, a pear, an apple, stuff like that. He had a good time. He did, uh, he painted, different times of the year, and this was autumn. Mushroom vendors are particularly interesting to some of us because they show what it is that people ate. So here you have a picture by a, a Flemish, a Flemish painter, uh, Franz Snyders, Snyders uh, fruits and vegetables then. You have big gourds here, a huge cabbage, cauliflower, a gigantic ones. Things are a little bit of size. And here are mushrooms. They look like field mushrooms, uh, cousins of the button mushroom you buy in the store. So here you have it. The mushrooms were sold in Flanders in the 16th century. And here's another one, also right from Flanders. Norbert van Brommen Corsephalus. Why the Corsephalus, I don't know. It's a veg vegetable vendor in a southern landscape with a caprice. A caprice is a sort of an inventive fantasy of Rome in the background. And here you have, uh, again, these gigantic cauliflowers, cabbages, uh, cucumbers, and mushrooms right on the, on the ground. So they, they were popular. And here is one of my favorite. This is an Italian, Felice Boselli, a little bit later, called the mushroom seller. And you have uh, Caesar's mushrooms here and probably some porcini mushrooms. In a very sort of a moving pose, she's carrying these from one place to another. And she got caught in the act. <clears throat> I think this is a very lovely painting. Uh, mushroom vendors, uh, there's uh, it tells you here from the Italian Baroque, uh, there were a lot of field champignons, probably porcini, 
Caesar's mushroom chanterelles, which some of you may know, and so forth. And the Flemish Baroque are a little bit different. Anyhow, we have some statistics in there. This is maybe the first painting of a cultivated mushroom, the white button mushroom, uh, from uh, probably around the beginning of the 18th century. This, uh, this is the mushroom that we know uh, find in the stores, the button mushroom, was cultivated first in France around the 17th century. So this may be the first painting of a cultivated mushroom. You can see that it's sold along with others and it looks a lot like, the, uh, maybe more a cremini than a white button mushroom. By the way, cremini and the white button mushroom are the same species. And guess what? So are portobello mushrooms, even though they're quite big, they're the same as the button mushroom only is grown, but they didn't grow out. The button mushroom is cultivated when it's young, it's a baby. If you let it grow, you end up with a cremini, and if you go further, you end up with a portobello. In later times, we find something very unusual. Victor Hugo, who been associated with with writing was also a painter and he painted a gigantic champignon, called it champignon. Champignon in French means mushroom. So uh, he painted a gigantic thing with a city in the background. This is really weird. And it looks like a, uh, a bolit, it looks like a uh, porcini kind of mushroom. Uh, the Hungarians and the Russians painted people collecting mushrooms. So we find a basket, sorry. Kids were sent out to collect mushrooms. They were told by the grandmother how to pick edible mushrooms. And then you have a couple of basket things for the mushroom collectors. The English were supposed to be non-mushroom lovers. But uh, here's a picture by Gainsborough, famous English painter, for the haymaker and the sleeping girl. And he has a basket, and you can oh, she has a basket here. Can't make it out too well, but, oh, here. In this basket, she has mushrooms. So it's not true that the British didn't pick mushrooms. They did, they just didn't make a point of it. They didn't brag about it, I guess. There also is a genre called the Victorian fairy paintings of the 19th century, where uh, people painted fairies. They look like uh, Barbie dolls only about this tall. And here you have the uh, fairies making a fairy ring, which is a mushroom motif, by the way, around, dancing around toadstools. Again, we have the toadstools. Yes, one which is dying and they are dying. Interesting. There's a whole collection of uh, fairy paintings and many have mushrooms in them. Here's another one by dad showing Puck sitting on a mushroom. And this is the end of my mushrooms in our story. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Cassandra Ablola and I'm the treasurer for the San Diego Mycological Society. I love mushrooms not only because they're delicious, but in the context of art and design. Today, we wanted to share with you a fun craft to share with the kids. We found some different ways to make origami mushrooms, but I wanted to show one version with you today. If you don't have origami paper, you can use plain paper or construction paper. Just make sure you start with a square. If you're using double-sided origami paper and you want the mushroom cap to be on the top, you would start with the polka dot side facing you. You're gonna start with your square and you're gonna turn it diagonal and you're gonna make a crease on the diagonal. You're gonna open it back up 
And then you're gonna take this corner and fold it to the center line. Then you're gonna do the same on the other side as well. So now it looks like an ice cream cone. You're gonna flip the piece of paper and you're gonna fold this triangle corner up. Next, you're gonna make another fold, like so. You're gonna take this corner and fold it to around this point so that it releases some tension on the paper. And you're going to fold the side and to the middle line. You're gonna do the same on the other side as well. It's starting to look like a mushroom. Next, you're gonna fold this corner up. And you're gonna fold these end pieces in towards you. And finally, you're gonna fold this top corner down. And when you flip, there's a mushroom. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I hope you enjoy this mushroom origami craft at home. Hello everybody, my name is Darcy Sazel. I am the artistic director for the club and we are working on some new designs. So get on our mailing list and check in on our website and see what we got going. Welcome to the 23rd Annual Fungus Fair. My name is Sarah and I'm the chef here at the Mycological Society. Uh, what I'm going to be making for you today is a wild mushroom and thyme gravy with brown butter biscuits. So good for breakfast, nice for dinner with some chicken. So here we have our brown butter. Um, 
This is made by cooking butter on low heat until you get some bubbles and the milk solids start to caramelize. Um, it gets to be very nutty and that flavor will um, work really well inside of that biscuit. So with the brown butter and any biscuit really, you want to freeze your butter. Um, what that does is inside of the biscuit, it creates nice pockets of air, which makes it nice and fluffy and flaky. So here I have my brown butter and I'm just gonna grate it with a cheese grater inside. This is not gonna be like a normal stick of butter just because you've cooked it before. So it's not gonna be uh, very thick like a normal stick of butter would be. So we've frozen the butter to make sure that it's cold because you want everything in your biscuits very, very cold. In order to keep this butter frozen, that gives us nice layers and flakes in our biscuit, makes it very light and fluffy. So here I have two cups of flour. I'm going to add three teaspoons of baking powder and one teaspoon of sugar. One pinch of salt and my butter. I like to make my biscuits with a wooden spoon. I think it's a little less invasive on that uh, beautiful brown butter that we have. So now that I have all that beautiful butter, sugar, salt, and baking powder mixed in, I'm just gonna add three quarters of a cup of milk. I use whole milk. Some recipes call for cream. I like to use milk. So we're just gonna lightly fold that in. We're gonna make sure everything in here is nice and put together. Again, we don't wanna stir it that much because we want that butter to stay frozen and not agitate it too much. So if your dough is a little bit too floury like mine is, I'm just gonna add just a touch more cold milk. Once it's nice and together, I can go in with my hands. And like I said, we don't want this mixed too much. We're just gonna form it. We're just gonna fold it about uh, five to six times. If you see those beautiful butter pieces in there, that's gonna make it nice and light and fluffy. So after we fold it a few times, we're just gonna press it out with our hands. You can also use a rolling pin if you'd like. You can cut your biscuits into squares or, or I have a ring mold right here which makes nice even sized biscuits. So we'll just take it like that, put it to the side, put it to the side, and, and in my opinion, I think it's okay if biscuits are a little bit rustic. I like rustic biscuits. They shouldn't have to be perfect in my opinion. So we're just, with the scraps, we'll put them back together and make some more biscuits with them. So what I've done here is I put the biscuits inside of the fridge because you want your biscuits, like I said before, nice and cold when you put them in the oven so that the butter doesn't melt and it just makes beautiful flaky texture for these biscuits. So here we're gonna start the gravy. First, I'm gonna put the butter in the pan. 
For mushrooms, like I said before, I really like to do brown, brown butter. Gives it a nice little layer of flavor. So we're just gonna melt this butter in the pan until it's all the way melted. I have my heat at a medium high right now. From here, we're going to add our mushrooms. So I have my Taki and white beech mushrooms. I'm just gonna leave these on the bottom of the pan, let them sit for about two minutes just to get some nice color on them, and then we'll come back to them. So now that we have our maitakis and our white beech mushrooms browning, we're gonna add our chanterelles. These are beautiful chanterelles. You can get them from any farmer's market or specialty produce has some amazing wild mushrooms as well. Uh, these are some nice chanterelle mushrooms that we're gonna put in our gravy. So those chanterelles we're gonna cook for about three to four minutes. And we are also going to add our onions and two cloves of garlic to this as well. So we're gonna let this go for about five minutes or until the mushrooms are nice and brown and crispy. We just took these biscuits out of the fridge they're nice and cold now and ready for the oven. I have my oven set at 450 degrees and it'll cook for about 15 to 17 minutes. So once the mushrooms are about halfway cooked, I'm just gonna add one sprig of thyme. I like to get big branches so that they stick together and they're easy to pull out of the mushrooms. Give it a nice stir, and we'll let that cook for just another few minutes to get some color on these mushrooms. Okay, so now that we have some beautiful color on these mushrooms and they're all the way cooked, smells amazing. You'll know when it's done when it takes up your whole house, this beautiful smell. So now that that's done, we're gonna make a roux, which is a flour and butter. It's gonna be able to thicken our gravy. So I have some flour here. I'm just gonna sprinkle just right on top of all these mushrooms and stir it up. We're gonna to wanna to cook this for just a few minutes because we need to cook the flour flavor out of this flour. So for about two minutes, I'll be stirring it. Right now is when I can add some salt and a little bit of crushed red pepper as well to give your gravy a little bit of spice. This of course is optional. Also some black pepper. Now that every mushroom is coated with this beautiful flour, you can smell all the spices and the thyme and the mushrooms brown butter. From here we're going to put some milk. So what it does is the, the flour is going to thicken the milk and turn it into a gravy. So here I have our milk. We're going to pour it in slowly. The way to know if your gravy is up to its full thickening potential is when it starts boiling, that's when you know that it will not get any thicker and that you've added the correct amount of um, milk. So sometimes if it's a little bit thicker, you can add more milk. That's what I'll do right now. Really smells amazing in here. The fresh herbs, beautiful wild mushrooms. And we're gonna let this um, simmer for about 
five minutes just to get those flavors really combined in there. So we're just gonna give this a little taste just to make sure the spiciness level is what you like and the saltiness level. Mm, delicious. These biscuits seem to be done. We're gonna pull them out now. Nice and brown, nice and flaky. So I just want to show you one of these biscuits we got. Nice crispy bottom from the cast iron. And look at these beautiful flakes we have. This is from that cold butter. Uh, just gonna flake apart really, really nicely. So here we're gonna plate one. I like to plate the whole biscuit and just put a little bit of that wild mushroom gravy on top. Okay, so if you have a black truffle salt, black sea salt, anything, I like the color contrast on there. It looks really nice. Thank you so much for tuning in to my brown butter biscuit and wild mushroom gravy demo. I really appreciate it and I hope that you make these recipes at home and please let us know on our Mycological page. We have Instagram or email. Please let us know if you enjoyed them or if you made them at home. I'm about to dig in right now. Thank you so much for tuning in. What's up, San Diego Mycological Society? It's Kristen and Trent Blizzard from Modern Forager. And we want to introduce you to our new book, Wild Mushrooms, a cookbook and foraging guide. You will find 115 recipes from 15 of our favorite wild mushrooms and stories from 25 awesome foragers from around the country. Yeah, the book is available on Amazon or from your favorite local book dealer. We'll see you in the woods. Bye-bye. Hello, I am Gavin Escalar, founder of The Chaga Company, and welcome to my San Francisco deck. Today, we are gonna be learning about my tinctures. Tinctures are really the best and most effective way for you to take chaga. We are the only company that do a three-pull extraction method on our tinctures. We do it in one of our mediums, whether it be alcohol or apple cider, and we also expose it to water, extract it with water, and then we expose it to UV light and ultrasound and you could take this for a 30-day supply if you take it twice a day. So we could take it sublingually. All we need to do is take half of a dropper full, like this, put it underneath your tongue, hold it for 45 seconds, and then swallow. And on the delivery that you could do is you could put it right on water like this, and then put water over it. Hot, cold, coffee, tea, juice, anything. Cheers. So good. I'm Yehuda Goldman, and I'm a documentary filmmaker in the Washington, D.C. area. 
And I'm going to be joining Rick Silber and International Mountain Trekking on an amazing expedition on a fungi foray into the Kumbu region of the Himalaya this summer. And I'm going to be documenting it and making a documentary film along with Rick and his team of scientists and Sherpas. So, Rick, uh, before we talk a little bit about that um, amazing trek that's coming up, let's hear a little bit about you. Well, thanks, Yehuda. I've been climbing and backpacking my whole life. I've had the great pleasure of being able to climb in Alaska, in North America, Africa, and Nepal. And uh, I think being able to have created an organization that allows people to experience these great mountains uh, in Nepal is a wonderful dream come true, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to do it. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, expectations. If somebody wants to come on the trek, what do they have to do? Look, uh, the kind of person that's going to want, we want to come on this, and we hope uh, will come on this, are people that have a sense of adventure, of exploration, of wanting to see something that may have never been identified before. I'm quite confident that uh, that we will discover new mushrooms on this trek, first wow. of all. I also will say this, um, trekking in Nepal is, is, uh, can be difficult, but it, it's completely up to everybody to become uh, in good shape, um, uh, to exercise before we go. And uh, we have uh, ways to help you do that, but it's totally manageable. And thousands of people trek in the Himalayas every year and, and do perfectly fine. So I'm there's not going to be ropes. We're not really climbing. It's more of an arduous type of trek. Um, what sure. about the, 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 the altitude? Tell us uh, how we're going to, um, you know, well, look, the, the um, altitude. altitude is something that can be well managed uh, with an appropriate itinerary. And we have that kind of itinerary. We have it uh, through our experience. We will have appropriate rest days to allow you to acclimatize. During those rest days, uh, you will be hiking, but you'll be returning back to where we're staying. So you'll hike high and sleep low, which is the perfect way for your body to get itself ready for taking on higher elevations. But again, we move up gradually. The itinerary of the trek is, is, is planned so that we're spending a little more time at lower elevations where there are mushrooms. And um, again, that'll give us more opportunity for acclimatization. Let's talk a little bit about um, your Sherpa team on the ground? Um, the Sherpas we work with are all seasoned, licensed, uh, high altitude guides who have uh, guided climbers uh, to the summits of the major mountains uh, in Nepal. Uh, the most notable one, of course, would be Mount Everest. So we're, we're dealing, we're, we're, we're going to be helped along and we're going to be guided by some of the world's, frankly, greatest uh, high altitude guides. I think that's important. Uh, let's let's bring on Matthew. Let's give uh, okay. let's bring Matthew on. Let's uh, talk to Matthew a little bit about um, what his PhD is in and um, his participation on this particular trek. What, what, tell us a little bit without going too deep into the weeds. But what's your expectations? What's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? So my personal research um, is actually into the ecology of fungal psilocybin production. So for anybody who doesn't know, psilocybin is one of the main active molecules in psychedelic mushrooms that make them psychedelic, make them magic. Um, but while there's a lot of really cool and interesting research going on about psychedelics today for the sake of mental health, um, you know, PTSD or, or addiction, any number of things, um, there is almost no research going on into the actual ecology in their natural environments. What are psilocybin producing mushrooms producing it for? Uh, what benefit does it confer to them in their natural environment? And that's my research. I am looking into psilocybin producers and what organisms they interact with to see if psilocybin has some sort of benefit. Is it a defense mechanism? Does it recruit other organisms um, for mutualistic purposes to help spread their spores? That's what I'm trying to figure out. So I'll be there looking at psilocybin producers, such as psilocybe species, um, and documenting them and their ranges and such, because I don't think that that's very well documented. That there's only been one paper looking at psilocybe species in the uh, in the whole country of Nepal, and none in the Kumbu region. So 
it'll be a really interesting time to look at those and then see also if I can document organisms that are working with them and take some soil samples to then see what microorganisms are living in their substrate with them, as well as um, taking samples of the mushrooms themselves to sequence their genetics and see if there are any other organisms living in and on the mushrooms themselves. So that's the basic idea is at this point, we're just trying to figure out who's there, who is interacting with these organisms. And then from there, we can start to try to figure out, okay, in what way does psilocybin mediate these interactions? Fascinating. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, uh, on any expedition like this, seeing something that I've never seen before, the, op the, the potential for discovery is always there. And that was what makes these kinds of things very exciting. So uh, very cool. Matthew, thank you so much. Um, Rick, before we talk to Dr. Dakota, let's talk about that 800 pound gorilla in the room, COVID-19. How are we going to deal with that? Folks going to want to know about their deposits, about safety of travel. I know you're monitoring the situation. Um, what's sure. is that a little bit that we'll get to Dr. Dakota? Sure. Yeah, look, um, COVID is obviously, you know, hanging over everybody and international travel is, is something that uh, is still being worked out. I am anticipating that in order to go and safely travel to Nepal, everybody will need to be vaccinated. And I believe that there's, uh, will be given what our people in the travel industry are basically calling a medical passport to demonstrate that you've had the, uh, you've been vaccinated. I believe that the, probably the protocols, which are still changing in Nepal for entry will require, uh, you to have a negative, uh, COVID test before you get on the airplane and probably to repeat that once we get there. But I think that's the entry into Nepal during this time. Okay, cool. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce my friend and co-leader of our Mushroom Trek, Dr. Shiva Devkota. Shiva is one of Nepal's foremost mycologists and we're just so thrilled to have him on this trek. Yehuda? Excellent, thank you. Uh, welcome all the way from Nepal, Dr. Devkota. How are you doing this morning? Hi, how's that? So good, good, good. Or, or late there for you. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to share screen, and you got some wonderful images that you're going to take us through um, that, you know, these folks might get to actually see some of these on their expedition. So here we go. So what, one of the things that um, we're going to see on this expedition is uh, the, the connection with the indigenous population and, in, you know, um, uh, integrating their local knowledge with science. You want to talk a little bit about that, uh, Shiva? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so here in these pictures, you, you, you can clearly see that I was just hiking on the way and I have seen a lady preparing mushrooms. And this is very common. This is very common in a season. So you can see that in every steps, in every 200 meter, every 500 meter, local people, they used to gather mushrooms nearby the forest. And this is a kind of post-harvesting technology. They have their own technology. They got it. And then now they are, tra they are trying to remove all the unwanted mushrooms, all the dots, and then they are preparing for, for post-monsoon season. And here uh, we see this uh, fabulous uh, Corvinolus mushrooms, and of course, Marcella morels, and this is one of the interesting mushrooms, Pallus indusiatus. And these all are very beautiful and then also very interesting mushrooms, uh, not only because of their color, not only because of their appearance, but because of their monetary value. And this Marcella species is uh, really important uh, for the mountain livelihood people, and I mean, they got fungus money. Uh, in a season, and it costs around one hundred dollar to up to two hundred dollar per kg uh, for wow. the uh, species. Yeah. Okay. So this is also really important for their daily livelihoods. And this is interesting mushrooms. I mean, I got it mushrooms at around four thousand meter altitudes, and I could not find its species, but I know that this is Rosula species, and this is edible one. And uh -huh. this is the different. This is the different species. What we got uh, in a, in a videos, you know. I mean, it's up to three thousand we call videos, and above three thousand we call highlands. So it is even before high, up, even up to highlands. I mean, it got around. Uh, it was collected at around four thousand meter. So this okay. is very interesting mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. 
And this, this tiny mushroom, so it's like, uh, it's a size of high life commune. And this is very interesting in terms of the spirituals or I would say ritual values. And uh, Tamang people, they are one of the very um, indigenous community and also the mycophilic community, they use it. And even another community like uh, Newars community, this is religious mushroom for them because uh, this is really necessary during their wedding ceremony. Uh, uh, Shiva, Shiva, is this an edible, this, uh, this mushroom here? Yeah, this one is edible, but it is really very hard to get enough. That's why they normally do not collect it, but this is edible. This is not a poisonous one. All right. Okay. okay. And uh, this is very well known mushrooms. So this is Cantarulus severus, and then even you can get this mushroom just after after the Larry Airport. I mean, just nearby the airport, we can collect it. And if you ask what it is, just prepare, and they will prepare fresh Cantarulus instantly. So, so, so what you're saying is that right outside the airport at Lukla, you're able to gather enough. Uh, uh, Cantharellus. Cantharellus, um, and take them into a tea house and they'll make yeah. them for you for a meal? What fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. very. Okay. This one is uh, very common mushrooms in, in average area. I mean, in a season, even a family can collect about 30 to 40 cases of these mushrooms in a season. I mean. Wow. And they collect it and then dried it for, for the post monsoon periods. And wow. they even prepare uh, their vegetables as used as a vegetables, as a pickle, and just to prepare soup. And if, if some travelers they want to have some fresh soup, they even ask you whether you want a soup from this fresh collection or you want a soup, you want to you want you want, you want to have a mushroom soup with their scanned mushrooms <laughs> and normal. And in our next plan from this coming season. Uh, we, we we are planning to have a detailed mushroom survey in every region. And so if I if I can if I can interrupt for just one second. So what what you're describing is that this trek will be part of a larger uh, research pro project project that you're working on that you're heading up to uh, characterize uh, in a way that's never been done before. Yep. the diversity of mushrooms within this extraordinary part of Nepal, the Kumbu region. So the, the, the people on our trek really will be in every step of the way, a citizen scientist contribution, right Shiva? Yes. Well, it's great. And even, even we could edge that, okay, if you be a part of these expeditions, your pictures, your informations will be included in these apps. Wow. Your pictures uh, will be included in this uh, public. That's great. I think we can we can, we can tell like that way. Yeah, Fantastic. that's great. That's exciting. So Rick, why don't, why don't we tell? Thank you, thank you very much for that. Let's um, tell folks how they can get in touch with you guys to join this expedition. Sure. First, I want to thank the San Diego Mycological Society for letting me make this presentation. If anybody would like to get in touch with me or get more information, my website address is www imt-nepal.com. And uh, Yehuda, why don't we play the little two minute video we've got prepared that will show people where we're going and how we're going. Imagine yourself exploring the world's most stunning travel destination and being one of the first to discover new mushrooms in the region. Join me, Rick Silber, Executive Director of International Mountain Trekking and Avid Mushroom Hunter, for an incredible eco-mushroom expedition to Nepal's Khumbu region, situated in the heart of the Himalayas. You no longer have to be an expert climber to experience these glorious mountains and mushrooms in their natural setting. We've custom designed this fungi foray to Everest Base Camp to be accessible for all skill levels of hikers. International Mountain Trekking's licensed guides and Sherpas are seasoned professionals and are trained to take care of all of our guests' safety and needs. 
This unique 15-day, all-inclusive mushroom-oriented trek combines adventure, culture, and science, and will be led by conservation biologist Dr. Shiva Devkota, Nepal's foremost mycologist. Along the way, we will spend time in Sherpa villages, meeting with local families and learning about their culture and way of life, culminating with a visit to the world-famous Sherpa Festival of Dumji. This trek is scheduled for peak mushroom season in the Khumbu. Please visit the International Mountain Trekking website for more details about our comfortable accommodations during the trek and our exciting itinerary. The group size will be limited, so I urge you to reserve your spot soon. I'm confident that you will find, just as I do, that this magical area of the world never ceases to amaze and inspire. I look forward to sharing this extraordinary experience with my fellow mushroom lovers. Buenos tardes, good afternoon, aloha. My name is Dennis Walker, and I'm a member of the San Diego Mycological Society. I've actually recently overtaken social media for the organization, and I'm the one posting all those mycology-related memes and cool photos that people have taken. I live in the south of Mexico, and I'm in fact so interested in mycology that I've positioned myself down here among one of the great mycological biodiversity hotspots in the world. Here's a few of the things that I've been doing to stay plugged in to the world of mycology and the San Diego Mycological Society. Chiapas has an incredible diversity and abundance of different types of mushrooms, especially now in the rainy season. There are estimates of upwards of 13,000 different types of mushrooms that thrive here in the mountainous highland environment and the lowland jungles of Chiapas. 300 of these varieties of mushrooms are deemed to be edible. The pre-colonial civilizations that are found in Mexico have an extraordinary and intimate connection with these fungi. In southern Mexico and Guatemala, there have been many different types of mushroom stones and carvings found. I'm currently also running a podcast called Mycopreneur, and we've had some of the most visible and well-known figures in the world of mycology on the podcast already. Would you like to be on the pod? Get in touch with me. If you're an entrepreneur, someone working with mushrooms who has a mushroom-related business or lifestyle, we would love to hear from you and get you on the pod. I hope all of you are having a wondrous, extraordinary day, and I look forward to continuing to build community and learn about the wonderful world of mushrooms with all of you. Hasta luego. Hello, ha, ha, ha. I'm French, nobody's perfect. Here today you are enjoying salumi and truffles. Truffles, we buy them, import them from Spain, France, Italy, or other countries, depending on the season. Uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Serbia, Romania, there's different countries who produce truffle. At this time of the year, we only import the black winter truffle. This one are from Perigord, France. Uh, it's called the Melano Sporum. Uh, they are at the peak of the season in terms of quality. The price is very good this year because of COVID. So thank you, COVID. With the truffles, we do a black truffle salami. We also use the Alba truffle to make the white truffle salami. We make black truffle butter with shrunk butter. 5% truffles, five. Same for the white. We have different size for retail. And also we do truffle oil. We import from France this truffle pearl, the amount of truffle juice, and they're very tasty. It's nice like a caviar to garnish or to finish a dish. We do uh, truffle powder as well. And for the gourmet chef, we do truffle juice. It's the juice extracted from the truffles when they're cooked and pasteurized. 
and we also have Truffle PDX or whole Truffle in cans. Thank you for listening. Up to see you soon. I'm Les Braun. I'm a past president of the San Diego Mycological Society, but I'm also our lichen guy. Um, lichens are a combination of fungus and algae. At least that's what we thought for 200 years. Um, recently, they found lichens around the world that had the same fungus and the same algae, but they looked different and they couldn't figure out why. Turns out that in 2016, some lichenologists around the world started researching that and they found out that there is a third component to lichens which we were unaware of for the last 200 years or so and that's yeast and that's why the same lichen or the same fungus and the same algae produce different looking lichens around the world but locally here we have quite a collection of lichens available we probably got two three hundred species of lichens in San Diego County most of them are growing on trees and rocks, but a few of them grow on dirt. And it turns out that the dirt lichens are the rarest lichens in San Diego, probably in maybe in even California in the country. And the reason that they're rare is that we've had a lot of uh, cattle ranches who have trampled the ground and they uh, kill the lichens and they break up the soil. They, these cryptogamic crusts are very important to keeping the soil in place. And lichens play a key role in that as do mosses and liverworts and that sort of thing. So anyway, I have a collection here of a few uh, soil lichens that are in the genus Cladonia. I think I have five here, but you can see that they, they're usually uh, kind of uh, folios. They're sticking up. They're, they're often on uh, raised stems called podidia. This is one here. This is uh, Cladonia sublata. Um, others are here. This is, uh, oh, I don't know which is which here. Anyway. Um, they're all drying up. This is Cladonia uh, sub scrabulosa. I'm sorry, and it looks kind of hairy. Um, some of the other really rare ones, though, are the ones, these Cladonia mushroom or lichens actually live in the shade on sides of hills and stuff. But the rare ones, like this right here, this is La Prairia. These are the ones that have been trampled by the cattle over the centuries, and these are the ones that are really rare as is this one right here, which is uh, Diplochistus. What I do with it? Right here. This is the other one. This is another soil lichen that grows right on the soil, obviously in full sun sometimes. And they, they're just really hard to find anymore. Um, other lichens that uh, our helper here is gonna be talking about are um, some lichens that are poisonous. Some lichens are edible. There's one lichen, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, right here. Avernia prunastri is a lichen that is used um, to create a stain or a dye called uh, royal purple. If you've had uh, royal crown liquor, the bag that it comes in is made with this lichen. It's been used for over 400 years to dye material. To identify lichens, you need a microscope and chemicals. You need Sodium hydroxide, which is like, uh, what do you call this, the plumber's, liquid plumber. And you also need uh, bleach. These are the two most common chemicals we use to identify mushrooms. And they identify the different acids that are in the mushrooms, or in the lichens. Um, without a microscope and chemicals, it's very difficult. If, if you find an orange mushroom in the genus Xanthoria or Caloplaca, something like that, and you treat it with, um, Put uh, sodium hydroxide, it'll turn purple immediately, bright purple. And uh, it's really a very quick and obvious reaction. These other lichens, like in the Cladonias, when you put uh, the bleach on them, they will turn red or yellow. And that's how you identify these things. 
It's not easy to identify these lichens, unfortunately. They're, they're, you know, you need the microscope, you need a compound and a dissecting scope to see them because you have to look for the different parts of them. There's some things called apothecia that you have to look for, and there's things called ceridia, which like look, look like little balls. And that's what you need to identify the, li the lichens with. That's basically what you need to know about lichens. I'm going to pass it off to Sienna now, and she's going to show you some of the chemical reactions, or at least one of them anyway, with the sodium hydroxide on a, probably a Xanthoria. So, Sienna? Hey guys, <laughs> I'm Sienna. I'm actually the education manager, but I know a couple of things about lichens that I'm going to teach you guys. Um, so, there's some really cool lichens in San Diego. Um, that you can find in the mountains or um, sometimes um, in the lowlands, like the deserts. Um, so, but one of my favorite ones uh, is this one, and it's actually called the wolf lichen. And that's because there's an acid in the lichen called vulpinic acid that will um, that is actually toxic. And back in the day when there was like farmers. Um, like worried about wolves eating their like uh, their cattle um, and like chickens they would actually put broken glass inside of like a deer carcass and they would also put these lichens in there and that would actually poison the, the wolves um, and prevent them from killing their cattle so these were really important for for those farmers um, and then um, another one is are these um, like orange ones? <laughs> um, they're uh, Xanthoridia, and they uh, will actually turn a different color if you put potassium hydroxide on it. And um, which one is that? That's the K one. Um, so I'm just going to show you guys right here. So hopefully it'll turn like a magenta, like purple. Hopefully you guys can see that. Oh yeah. So pretty. <laughs> yeah, and that's one way you can sort of like ID these lichens is by what color they change. Um, and then one last lichen I wanted to highlight um, was this it's called an oak moss, or like in the genus Avernia. Um, and so they are actually found around the world and they um, have been really important in actually making perfume. Uh, so they'll be using these in a lot of like traditional perfumes. Like you can still actually smell them today in like modern perfumes. Um, and Les like talked about how they would make like the royal purple. So they're pretty important lichen and so we we've been using lichens really commonly for forever it's just um, not a lot of people know what they are but they're really pretty they come in all different colors different shapes and even during the winter even though we don't really have winter here in San Diego um, they will brighten up all the trees in the forest and um, actually bring color into like the deserts here um, so I encourage you guys to go out and look for these beautiful little creatures. And if you find them, you can post them on iNaturalist or send them over to our SD Myco Instagram and we'll try to help you ID them or figure out what they are. So, And then one last thing is, um, so you guys, if you're really interested in lichens, uh, you guys can check out this book, A Field Guide to California Lichens by Stephen Chernoff. Um, and so this is like a really good like beginner's guide to learning about the lichens of California and about um, like how to ID them and sort of more about the science behind IDing them. So thank you guys. <laughs> it all is what it is. Yeah. Put it in there, so it's like a big tea bag. It and is. And I just stuck it in hot water. So it's literally thing. making poisonous mushroom tea. <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> yeah.
Hello, my name is Andrew Gottlieb. I'm a member of the San Diego Mycological Society. I have been for over a decade, and I'm not actually officially a board member, but I like to participate and volunteer and help out, mostly on the AV side and operational side. But one of the great things about the Mycological Society is that we are a society, and everyone gets to contribute how they see fit. We're open to the public, and if people want to come and move chairs around or Whatever they want to do to help out is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to our annual fungus fair. It was really a great honor to bring you a whole list of talks and presentations and we can hope to continue to do more in the future. Again, you feel free to stay connected with us um, through Facebook, Instagram, our YouTube and any other other social media channels as well as tuning in to the first Monday of every month as we bring you a special guest speaker. But for now, Stay healthy, stay well, and may so your families. We'll see you soon.